Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us in this uh, hall, full auditorium, but also online. Uh, my name is Evangelos Jamarelos Burbulis. I'm uh, the current chairman of the European Sepsis Alliance, and I wholeheartedly welcome you to this annual meeting of the European Sepsis Alliance. Uh, it's very important to be here, and uh, before starting the meeting, I just want to say a few words. The idea is not just to present the problems of sepsis. The idea is that all of us in Europe are united in the fight against the top killer of this continent and the top killer of the world. And all of us does not mean just healthcare providers. It means all people. It means patients. It means politicians. So we want to convey that message. And if we manage to achieve so, you will realize at the end of today's session that all of a sudden healthcare will substantially be improved in this Europe and in this world. Because you will soon understand that it's not just staying alive and discharged alive from hospital. It is what is happening in your life long term. With this, I would like to thank you very much for coming here. I would like to uh, make clear that the European Sepsis Alliance is a member of the Global Sepsis Alliance. It's a huge privilege for us that the founder, the generator of the idea, Professor Conrad Reinhardt, he is with us. I hope that the young generation will be e efficient and as good as uh, our mentor, Professor Reinhardt, told to us. And with this, I would like to uh, present and pass the microphone to the moderator of today's event, Ulrika Knudsen. She's a member of the board of the European Sepsis Alliance, and she's coming from Sweden. Ulrika. Thank you, uh, Evangelos. So, welcome all, as Evangelos said, to this uh, European Sepsis Annual Meeting. European Sepsis Alliance annual meeting. This is the sixth time that we meet in this format, uh, and we're really happy that all of these people are coming here in Brussels, but also a lot of people joining us online uh, all around Europe. As Evangela said, European Sepsis Alliance is a part of the Global Sepsis Alliance, and ESA was founded in 2018 with the aim to raise awareness around sepsis, but also, of course, reduce death due to sepsis. And uh, at the time uh, ESA was founded, it was founded with the auspices of uh, former European uh, Commissioner uh, for Health and Food Safety, Eventis uh, Andriakatis. And we're very happy that you're here today also, and you will join us later on in, in one of the panels. Um, sepsis, this life-threatening condition that occurs when the immune system is dysregulated uh, due to an infection, is really a global health crisis and not just a European health crisis. Uh, it affects almost 50 million people every year, and uh, about somewhere between 11 and 13 million die. Uh, in 2017, WHO uh, made sepsis a health priority, global health priority, by adopting a sepsis resolution uh, to um, prevent and to improve uh, diagnosis and, and management for sepsis. And this was really a big step forward uh, in the fight against sepsis. Since then, we've had a pandemic uh, and the, due to the coronavirus and the COVID pandemic really put new uh, focus and, and a spotlight on sepsis uh, since those who became most critically ill due to sepsis, uh, due to uh, COVID and ended up in the ICU actually had uh, a form of sepsis, viral sepsis, virus triggered sepsis. Um, so the pandemic really put a new focus on sepsis. But we like to start really this program really at the heart of the, uh, the topic, and that is with the patients. Um, this, as we said, is, is a condition that affects a lot of people. Uh, a German study from 2021 showed that almost 75% of sepsis survivors suffer from a new uh, medical con uh, conditions, so diagnosis, cognitive or physiological, uh, within the first year post-sepsis. Uh, 
and one third were newly dependent on uh, nursing care, and uh, three in ten die within the first year of uh, post-sepsis, this uh, study shows. So even if uh, sepsis is an acute condition that can rapidly become life-threatening, it is also a condition that uh, can lead to more long-term effects. Um, and we will uh, start with talking a little bit to uh, one of the sepsis survivors of this world. Um, Christina Björkvist will join us here now, talking as uh, a sepsis survivor from Sweden. And uh, she had had sepsis twice, once in 2007, uh, not so severely, and one really bad turnout in 2016. And please come up here and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what happened to you. Thank you. Welcome. So let's yeah. start, Christina, with, um, with your episodes. Can you talk us through what happened in 2007 and 2016? Yeah, in 2007, um, the, my first uh, time, uh, there was a, a GP that realized that I had sepsis um, uh, associated with the mastitis. And she sent me to the hospital where I was immediately taken care of and treated for, for uh, uh, infection and sepsis. Uh, and I was dischar discharged after a week and I relatively quickly bounced back to normal. So since I was taken, maybe it was because I was taken care so quickly, it didn't turn out badly for me. And that, when the second time, 2016, uh, I thought help at an emergency room. Uh, I had shortness of the breath and I had severe chest pain and I was very confused. Uh, uh, and I had ever felt that ill before. Uh, after a while, I was sent home with paracetamol and diagnosis with unspecified flu. Two weeks uh, later, uh, two days later, <laughs> I took a warm bath because I had severe chill, uh, muscle pain and headache. I also had difficult breathing uh, as before uh, and con continued severe uh, chest pain. I was very confused and I was absolutely convinced that I was going to die. And I passed out in the bathroom my husband realized that I was very sick, so he was working from home. And that was probably saved my life because he could call the ambulance. In hospital, I was immediately put uh, into a ventilator, into coma. And they realized that I had the swine flu. I wasn't aware of that before. And uh, I also, so and that has, um, developed pneumonia. I had septic shock, ARDS and uh, heart and um, kidney failure. Uh, after two days, uh, I was, uh, it has developed in a bad direction, so I was put into ECMO uh, because they didn't think they could uh, save my life. Uh, in the ICU. I was treated with VA ECMO and Impala for two weeks. In total, I had to spend five weeks in the ICU. And most of the time I was in coma, so I don't have any memory of that time, a uh, long part of my hospital stay. And uh, the immediately time after, I was very confused. Uh, I didn't know where I was, and I was sliding there and to other locations. And uh, I, um, a part of time, I thought I was there in business, doing some sort of business. Um, but uh, most of the time, it was filled with the terror and fear. It was so scary to, to wake up after. Uh, the coma. Uh, when I woke up, I was paralyzed. I could move my left shoulder. Um, during the time in ECMO, I had uh, 25 septic embolies uh, in my brain. 
that has left me with as many centimeter big um, injuries. At the same time, I suffered from critical illness. Um, I had to learn everything again, like coughing, eating, sitting and walking. Um, I spent totally 101 days in hospital and was discharged on a sunny spring day. Thank you. So uh, we are going to talk later on this afternoon in the panel about the long term effects uh, due to sepsis. And we know that many sepsis survivors suffer from long term effects, not only physical ones, but also many cognitive like brain fatigue and depression and anxiety, sleep deprivation and so on. Um, in what way have sepsis affected you and sort of what are your struggles in your everyday life due to sepsis? Yeah. Uh, before I got my second sepsis, I was an, an energetic and fit mother of two girls uh, with a stressful job in the pharmaceutical industry. And the septic shock has totally uh, changed my life. After this discharge, I had to stay at a neuro neurological rehabilitation, where among other things, I had to start to learn to walk again. It's a skill that I still regularly practice with the physical therapist. Uh, despite intensive training, I have not regained the strength, the flexibility or the balance. Uh, so I can't walk far, I can't climb stairs and I can't uh, carry anything heavy. And if I overexert myself, um, I find it very difficult to walk again. It's like um, a curtain <laughs> goes down and I'm almost paralyzed again. Um, another issue is a cr critical illness that uh, damaged the nerves um, and especially to my feet. So it's a lot of pain in my feet and that also makes it sometimes di difficult to walk. Uh, and after the septic embolid during the ECMO tie, I have brain fatigue. So I need to plan the day uh, based on that. Uh, the cognitive parts work well as long as I'm not tired. Uh, so it requires a lot of planning to be able to have those break so that I don't get tired. Um, the combination of the physical and uh, the fatigue has meant that I have not yet been able to wo uh, work, but uh, shortly I will make an attempt to uh, go back to work. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, finally, you were really instrumental in the startup of uh, the Swedish patient, um, Sepsis Patient uh, Association, Sepsis Föreningen. Um, this was almost three years ago now. Uh, mm. In your opinion, uh, what role do these kind of patient advocacy groups like yours uh, play in, in, in the fight against sepsis in, in Europe? I think it's important that the patient's perspective is included in all contexts where decisions are made about how to uh, sepsis patients should be handled. I also think it's important that we have patient associations that can influence politicians uh, to create uh, conditions in the healthcare system so that uh, sepsis is better acknowledged. Uh, I have personally participated as a patient representative in the development of the national standardized uh, care process of sepsis. In that work, it was important to include patients' perspective and I experienced that my work um, played a role in that, um, in that work and perhaps above all when it comes to follow up and discharge. Mm. I believe that uh, we as a patient association can influence the healthcare system to implement the standardized care process locally in hospitals as quickly as possible. For us, it's important that the patient perspective or the patient receive prompt and equal care 
throughout the country and throughout Sweden. As many patients are affected by physical, psychological, cognitive, PTSD or fatigue problem after sepsis, we believe as an association that we must emphasize that patients should re receive good rehabilitation. We feel that many patients are left alone uh, without help to deal with their issues after sepsis. We can also be involved in increasing knowledge about sepsis in general in society so that patients can have their needs heard of at workplaces and in contacts with the social insurance funding, etc. Thank you so much, Christina. This has been a really good stepping stone for us today, I think, to listen to your story and your perspective on, on sepsis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's continue now with uh, to hear a little bit more about findings uh, from the European Sepsis Care Survey that was conducted at University Medicine in Greifswald by and uh, led by Dr. Christian Scheer, who is here with us today, and he will uh, come up here and talk a little bit more about the findings, the best practice, but also what kind of challenges we are facing when it comes to sepsis management in Europe. So, Christian, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure and an honor today to speak in, in this uh, annual meeting. Yeah, I'm an intensivist uh, at University of Medicine in Greifswald, Germany, and I was in the last year the principal investigator of the European Sepsis Care Survey together with a great steering committee and a, a large number of uh, very helpful national coordinators. And we conducted the survey in, or finalized the survey in the last year. Yeah, my agenda today is to explain a little bit what is the European Sepsis Care Survey, who participated in this survey. And in a second part, I will uh, show you or present uh, some results of, of this project, a little bit about the current uh, status of early recognition of sepsis in European hospitals, then a little bit about opening hours of microbiological laboratories, because they are very important for pathogen identification. And in the end, I will show you a little bit about the presence uh, of quality improvement initiatives for sepsis in Europe and also worldwide. Yeah, what is the European Sepsis Care Survey? Up to now, we have no data, no information about uh, structures or capabilities in hospitals. We don't know how the hospitals work if they have uh, early recognition, for example, if they have laboratories, if they use quality improvement. And that was the reason why we uh, started in uh, 2021 the European Sepsis Care Survey. And we did this, or we started this in the European Union, and in the end we had a sample uh, uh, worldwide. Yeah, this is a little bit background. You see the European Sepsis Care Survey has five parts. It started with the general part, then we had three parts, one for the emergency department, one for the ward, and one for the uh, intensive care unit, and in the end uh, some questions about quality improvement. Um, we asked in total 94 questions, so the, the survey, the project was uh, really complex and comprehensive, and it took on average uh, 80 minutes. So this was very challenging uh, for, for the participants. And we asked questions about capabilities and resources, about early recognition, which is very important, if they use guidelines or protocols for sepsis care, about the diagnostic capabilities, like imaging, like source control, and also uh, like the microbiological process and diagnostics, and also about uh, quality uh, indicators. 
yeah, the, the project or the survey was reviewed by scientific uh, boards from three societies. And in the end, the, the project was endorsed by a large number of uh, international and European um, yeah, societies. And I would like to take the opportunity and say thanks for, for, for this support. Yeah, our uh, recruitment started in uh, 2021, and this was a very challenging time during the pandemic. Um, um, in the beginning, we had only uh, some hospitals in Europe, and over the time, the number increased. And you see here, each dot represents a hospital. And um, yeah, the national coordinators were very helpful, and the societies were very helpful in and in the end, we were able to, yeah, to achieve a, a very nice sample. Yeah, you see that our recruitment uh, take place in uh, multiple uh, regions worldwide. Um, most of the hospitals were included in Europe. Again, each dot here is, is one hospital. And, um, yeah, the main sample was in northern, eastern, southern, and western Europe. In total, more than 1,000 hospitals participated in the survey. And you can see on, on this chart um, that mostly head of departments answered the questions or consultants. So I think this is very important. They know. Uh, uh, their departments very well. Um, you see that most of the hospitals who participated were general or community hospitals or university or teaching hospitals and only a small number of, of um, private hospitals. And you see on, the, on this uh, circle that most of the hospitals, more than half of the hospitals, were small hospitals with small numbers of beds, up to 500. Yeah, one of our question was, do you have a protocol or a standardized screening tool specifically for the recognition, for the early recognition of sepsis? And uh, this question was very open. So to answer this question with yes, we have screening, um, the participants had to have, for example, serious criteria for screening, QSOFA, SOFA, or one of the early warning scores. But we considered also any other tool, maybe a tool which the hospitals um, developed um, on their own. You see that there are very simple uh, scores. Here's one comprehensive score from the UK Trust. So every tool uh, available was considered for, for, this, um, for this question. And we asked the question about the screening for the emergency department, separate for the ward and separate for the intensive care units. Because I think uh, you cannot compare these units. They are very different in the hospitals. And we analyzed um, the hospitals uh, according to, to the number of beds. So uh, we uh, classified um, five hospital sizes, small hospitals and larger hospitals. And here you can see the results for the screening. You see on the x-axis, uh, uh, um, the hospital sizes, small hospitals, from zero to 250 beds. And here on the right side, the large hospitals with more than 1,000 beds. And you see the bars. The bars represent the proportion of emergency departments um, who use a screening, yeah, screening tool. And you see that the average is 50%. And you see also that larger hospitals are not better than smaller hospitals. I think that's very important or interesting. And you see the intensive care units have a little bit higher 
proportions in all hospital sizes. Uh, the emergency department is in the middle. And yeah, the screening is uh, used uh, less in, in the wards. In total, we can say that in the European Union, we have screening or early recognition in 57% uh, of the emergency departments, 47% of the wards, and 61% of the intensive care units. The microbiological pathogen and identification is also very important in the, in the treatment of sepsis. Um, because if we as clinician know uh, the pathogen, we, this influences directly the, the decision making, the escalating or de-escalating or uh, also the termination. We also know from the literature that 20 to 35 percent of the initial uh, treatment is uh, not adequate inappropriate and we know that this is uh, connected with an excessively high mortality so it is very important to to have or to know the the uh, causative uh, pathogen on the other hand the microbiological pathway is very complex very comprehensive time consuming and needs a uh, uh, laboratory stuff. It starts with, with, uh, uh, with taking the blood culture, then you have the incubation, um, then you have the identification of the pathogen, and in the end, uh, 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 antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Um, so it is important that that workflow goes without a stop that it moves on and that you uh, at the ward have, have the result as soon as possible. At each step, you need, you need uh, um, laboratory stuff. And if the laboratory is not open, if it is closed or the opening hours are limited, then this process stops and you have uh, delayed information. So, we ask the participants um, about their opening hours. If the laboratories are 24 seven open from Monday to Friday and also and the, at the weekend and also at holidays, I think it's very important. And for, for, uh, to answer this question with yes, we, we, um, we said that the um, laboratories have to provide at least the blood culture incubation, the pathogen identification, and the communication of the results. And if the laboratories have all these three things 24-7, then they could answer, yes, we have a 24-7 service. And if the hospitals or the laboratories have this service uh, not in place. They were also able to describe their service um, uh, and, and the limited times. And yeah, these are the results for the, for the opening hours. Um, you see again here the hospital sizes, very small hospitals and larger hospitals. You see that the proportion is a little bit higher in larger hospitals, but in, in, in all hospital sizes, is, is, the rate is lower than 20%. So I think this is a, a very uh, bad result. And yeah, the question is, does this result have any impact on, 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 the, um, on the process? We analyzed the question about the laboratories also on the, um, on the level of the regions. And you see here again that the levels are very low. Here is this line is uh, 20%. You see that uh, 
for example, in Northern Europe, 20, uh, no, 10 percent um, laboratories are 24 seven open. Uh, in Eastern Europe, the rates are lower, lower than 10 percent. Uh, in Southern and Western Europe, a little bit higher. But in total, uh, we can say 24 seven microbiological service is only in 12% available in the European Union. So this is very, very low. Yeah, does this uh, have any impact? Um, to dive a little bit more in, into this question, we asked the participants, um, how does it long, uh, how, how long does it take until you receive a first result from, from your lab laboratory? Um, and you see here uh, different uh, timestamps, uh, 0 to 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours. And we grouped the hospitals, uh, the hospitals with a limited service and the hospitals with 24 seven service. And if we look at the first uh, time, 0 to 12 hours, Then you can see here 7% of the laboratories with limited service uh, receive a, a first result compared to 19% of hospitals with 24-7 uh, service. This difference is significant. And also at the time 12 to 24 hours, you see the large difference here uh, at this time, 48% uh, of the hospitals with a limited service have a first result compared to 70% of the hospitals um, uh, with 24-7 with service. Yeah, in the end, we have the question about the uh, sepsis training or the sepsis quality improvement. And also, this question was very open, so the participants had just had to have one of, of these elements, for example, education or training or feedback rounds or case reviews. And if they had um, anything of these uh, things, they uh, were asked to answer this question with yes. So do you have a sepsis training or sepsis quality improvement program? Here are the answers or the results for the different hospital sizes. You see in smaller uh, hospitals, the, the rate or the proportion is a little bit lower, 25%. In larger hospitals, there is a little bit more quality improvement. And we analyzed also this question uh, on the level of the regions. And yeah, you can see here large differences. So within the countries, we, we, um, we, we saw a range between uh, 0 and 80 percent. 0 and 80 percent. And you see, for example, in Northern Europe, we have yeah, the highest rate in Europe, the highest rate of quality improvement initiatives. And uh, this rate is mostly triggered uh, by Ireland and uh, United Kingdom. And you see that the lowest, rate, the lowest rates are observed in Western Europe. And this uh, yeah, low number is mostly triggered by the results of Germany, Belgium and France. And yeah, the quality improvement uh, in in initiatives in hospitals in the European Union are available on average on 29%. So this is also uh, a very low number. Yeah, I come to my con conclusion. So early recognition of sepsis is not sufficiently established in European hospitals. Weaknesses are seen especially at the wards, but also uh, at the emergency departments and ICUs. The microbiological laboratory service is yeah, too often timely limited. And this causes uh, significant delay in, in pathogen uh, uh, identification. 
and quality improvement initiatives are only little established in the European Union. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we have time for any questions, if, if someone has a question to Christian. Um, Conrad? Yeah, uh, so in some way this is of course disappointing, but I think in reality the things are even worse uh, because this is a kind of convenient sample and we, uh, uh, so this is not uh, randomly <laughs> chosen. And, uh, and obviously these are the hospitals who are interested at all uh, in sepsis because um, otherwise they would not have participated. So, yeah, that's the, that's the reality from my perspective. I think we might uh, continue if anyone else have a question. Otherwise, I think we'll continue with the... Oh, you have one, okay, Evangelos. Well, I would like to thank you very much for this initiative because uh, uh, you took over and you uh, gave us uh, uh, big and real uh, big uh, challenges. And I believe that we need to be taught by that. And uh, all your conclusions uh, are for us key messages for action. So it is obvious that education is becomes the top priority of, Euro of the European Sepsis Alliance. Could I have your comment on that? Yeah, I think uh, we should uh, move on. This is only uh, a first step, this analysis. Um, I think uh, we are now uh, analyzing the data and I, I think we uh, can provide insights and details for, for many countries uh, and can provide individual results and individual weaknesses. And we can yeah, use this information to yeah, increase the awareness and uh, maybe to establish quality improvement and early recognition. Thank you, Christian. I think, uh, okay, another one. <laughs> Let me come here. I would like to, to also comment that uh, and in, in my country, uh, uh, from the point of view of national co coordinator, is that uh, this survey was um, driven most, maybe, maybe not mostly, but many times by sepsis um, enthusiasts. So uh, many phone calls that I had with, with my friends from, from other hospitals, they said, oh, how good that you do it, because uh, where well, my friends from, from wards, from surgery or internal medicine was, they don't understand what sepsis is. I, I don't know if, uh, how about impressions from other countries? Do you have an answer for that, Christian? Yeah, in, in my country, in Germany, the, the recruitment was also very challenging. Uh, we had uh, two research fellows who called all the hospitals in Germany two times. And yeah, we, we collected the sepsis interested hospitals. Yeah, they said, yeah, great that you do this. And um, we enjoyed the participation, but other hospitals uh, do not answer. And we don't know what, what is the structure uh, in these hospitals. And, I believe that the rate of, of screening is lower in these hospitals. I think there is a bias uh, to uh, by, by the sepsis-interested hospitals, but also these rates are very low. And uh, in reality, I believe the rates are lower. But we have to go on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for this very important data. Um, what what is uh, a major concern is the very few hospitals that allow access to pathogen identifications on a 24-7 basis. It's very likely that it is not related to willingness from physicians, microbiologists not to provide these data. It's more likely related to economic constraints uh, within the hospitals. And as you highlight, education is important. Education of physicians, for sure, 
but also education of policymakers, uh, education of uh, uh, those responsible for the uh, hospital organization, uh, and pointing out the fact that it's of extreme importance, or the utmost importance, that in any hospitals, 24-7, <coughs> access to uh, pathogen identification is a bottom line of quality of care. And I think this is something that should be said and, and really uh, put up from because this is one aspect of sepsis management on which we can make substantial improvements in a very, very short period of time with a huge impact on patients' survival and patients' long-term outcomes. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Thank you. Um, in case of myocardial infarction or stroke, we would not uh, uh, um, wait. No. Yeah, <laughs> unimaginable, mm. yes, uh, to have limited uh, opening hours. Uh, yeah, this is. This is re really true too. I think maybe we can uh, start with the panel because we're sort of using your figures here and the data as a stepping stone for this discussion, I think. Uh, what is, how is the preparedness when it comes to sepsis management uh, and in terms of and the threats? Oh, sorry, Dennis, uh, another question, Christian. Sorry, <laughs> one more. Yeah, sorry, um, uh, as a, as a, a sepsis survivor, uh, I wanted to say thank you very much for um, carrying out that um, study as well, because um, from a patient's perspective, it can really also be quite unsettling. I had the uh, situation, for example, that um, uh, uh, you know they, they took a bacterial, uh, they, they took a they took a blood sample. Um, I had already part of my foot amputated, and they said, "Well, if it's um, if it's a resistant bacteria, we will have to amputate your leg." Right? And then you wait for the weekend and the bank holiday to get the result, um, which is really not great. So, um, uh, so first of all, thank you for, for doing this. My question is, have you started discussing this with policymakers or, or, or uh, hospital management that can change this situation? And if you have, what sort of response are you getting? No, we are no at this stage. Uh, we are... Uh doing the analysis and compiling the results. And this is one of the first meetings where we present some of the results. Um, yeah, so we start this process. Okay, um, I would like to, we're going to have a panel debate here now about uh, the preparedness when it comes to sepsis management and if it's moving faster than, than the threats ahead, such as maybe a new pandemic or um, the problem with the anti, uh, antibiotic resistance and so on. Uh, I would like to present uh, the moderator for this panel, Hatis Beton, who is the executive director for the G20 Health and Development Partnership. And you will present the rest and, and introduce the rest of the panel. So welcome. First of all, while one of our panelists is getting mic'd up, um, I would like to thank um, the previous speakers, especially Christina, for your intervention. I think only when we hear stories like from yourselves, we know really as someone who's not in the health field like myself, um, what sepsis can cause uh, in its long-term effects. So thank you uh, for, for your experience that you shared with us. Um, I am Hatice Beaton. Uh, I'm the executive director of the G20 Health and Development Partnership. Um, we are a group of um, a global network of global health organizations that advocate towards the G20 every year uh, how we can combine uh, some of the key global health challenges that we are facing in the next few years, especially when it comes to infectious diseases. And our mantra and the Global Sepsis Alliance is part of our partnership is to show how um, can we attract um, the uh, attention of finance ministers globally to show that health is not a cost in itself, that health is a sustainable investment in socioeconomic um, wealth and well-being for the future. Uh, and for that reason, I think the numbers and the cost implications have spoken for itself that were presented here today, which we will touch on in a minute. Let me introduce my uh, panel first. Uh, here today we have Konrad uh, Reinhardt, professor, 
Thank you for uh, being with us here today. Uh, Conrad is the, um, I think, the guru in sepsis uh, globally. Uh, I, I met him two and a half years be, ago. Be there of gurus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, he's the president of the Global Sepsis Alliance and uh, professor for sepsis awareness at Charité uh, Universitätsmedizin Berlin. Then we have uh, Dr. Um, Professor Evangelos uh, Giamarellos Borbolis, sorry for my pronunciation, Professor of Internal Medicine at Athens Medical School and um, obviously Chair of the European Sepsis Alliance. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Vitus Andrakaitis with us, former EU Health Commissioner and now WHO Special Envoy for um, the European region. So, but if I may, I yeah. started in my work as a doctor in very small hospital in far from from big cities in small hospitals, I know very well about what we just speaking. It's so important. That's perfect. That's that's th that's the kind of politicians we need. You see, <laughs> <laughs> good. So um, to start off the conversations, um, I would like to make, uh, if you allow me, for thirty seconds, a little social experiment because we speak about policy, advocacy, and awareness. How many people in this room are um, doctors? Okay, majority. And how many in this room are policy makers, work in government? Okay, so yeah. <laughs> and how many are um, from the private sector, like pharma or any other related businesses? Interesting. And how many are um, academics as such? Interesting. And civil society as a last question? All right. So, yeah, patient and family organizations. Okay. Yeah, that counts into that. Perfect. So, look, if you look at the room, I mean, I can see all of you. You can see by the snapshot of who's in the room that we are speaking about political advocacy and awareness raising, but we only have yourself and myself as a G20 policy campaigner and political economist in the room, right? So what we learned from here today is we need to speak more to policymakers actively and use the voices of patient advocacy groups that was raised before uh, by Christina as well. However, I'm not here to speak today because we have uh, the great um, uh, panelists here with us. So I would like to um, start maybe perhaps with you, Conrad. Um, you heard Christian's um, uh, European sepsis survey results and the shocking numbers of hospitals not um, uh, preventing and diagnosing early enough. So what is your take on, uh, on his presentations and how do you think we can change the awareness raising within hospitals uh, in Europe? Yeah, so that's the right question and what we had to learn, as I am an intensivist by training, is uh, what the cancer people learned at the end uh, uh, in the 40s, 50s of the last century. And they understood that a disease needs to be transformed politically before it can be transformed scientifically. And they had ads and you need to do campaigns like for soap or for whatever and they had ads in the washington post mr nixon you can cure cancer they asked for a moonshot against cancer they asked for a manhattan project against cancer they achieved that the regulations for the national institute of health were changed they were the ones who were able to develop this concept for pro comprehensive sepsis uh, cancer centers, which we would badly need also for, for cancer. So that's, it's all about nothing happens in any health system and any countries, which does not, and it's perhaps better in countries who have national healthcare system, where per definition the responsibility is where it needs to be at the end, at the policy makers who are, need to be the best advocates. But in most countries, it's that only things happen if the advocates, if the families, if the survivors uh, take up this lobbying work. So this is, I think, the key lesson. And if we are not able to put up the same pressure um, that was happened for other diseases with much bigger and stronger 
lobbying groups, we won't be able to make a difference. And it's not bad will by the policymakers, but they select their priorities to a, de to a large degree how their voters would think, and their voters are influenced by media and, 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 and what they learn in school and, and in what is in TV, etc. So that it's that simple or that difficult as it is. Thank you, thank you, Conrad. And um, coming to you, um, Dr. Andrew Kaitis, um, as the former EU Health Commissioner, a practitioner yourself, um, you heard now again the shocking statistics. And a, an interesting point that I captured from the session was training, actually. Uh, lack of education and training amongst healthcare workers was a key component. Um, what is your general take on the experience that Christina shared with us? Can you? Give a bit of your reflections from what you heard so far. First of all, Christina, thank you for listening to your story. I was so touched in my heart because, you know, I, I was a cardiac surgeon. I did this septicemia uh, big time of my, of my part. But, you know, your question is so complicated, so difficult to answer about training issues, about, you know, and, and also, also, you know, we are all, all are using the word awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. Simple word, but this is a complicated word because it requires a lot of multi-sectorial issues and a lot of efforts, not only from patient advocates and well, not only from societal, but also from, you know, from how to say, big movements which are uh, which keen to to say yes. Look, hey, health is human rights. We need now more health at European level. We need more health when we are speaking at councils level. We are speaking about European Parliament level. We need also more at, at national parliament level. Can you imagine how it's difficult to 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 join, for example, 27 members of your of Parliament and to. He explained them that it's a very difficult issue. It touched everyone in because statistics shows, you know, one person dying in, in, in every minute in around we are sitting here, and in one minute one person dies of sepsis in Europe. It's it's now it's 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 issue issues now. How can we use our words, our you know, our I like to say, feeling that we can, we can achieve more because we know from scientific point, we know answers, we know what can we do. But, but it is so complicated to, 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 you know, to, to encourage all actors to understand it, necessity, especially when we are speaking about prevention issues. Once again, very complicated word. I spent five years being a commissioner uh, responsible for food and uh, health, public health and food safety. Can you imagine how many uh, demonstrations were around me speaking about glyphosate or animal welfare standards? Yeah. And what about patients' rights? Zero. Zero. Please look at European Parliament. You have one in my mandate. I, I, I was always uh, uh, invited to discuss about animal welfare issues. 168 parliamentarians were an intergroup about uh, animal welfare issues. Why? Because it's politically sound. You can, you know, calculate votes. You can act within society. And how many people are worried about cancer? 17. Or about people about undergrad of HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis is also infectious diseases. And all, all, only when COVID striked Europe, <gasps> then everyone just speaking about COVID. Everyone. But COVID is also only one of situations because sepsis per se is a very difficult issue. And complications with sepsis, with COVID, also are sepsis. And all deaths also are sepsis. And nobody is care about sepsis. Why? Because we need to, you know, we need to speak with, uh, with, with journalists, with newspapers, with, because, you know, who is just follows Lancet, uh, you know, uh, uh, articles? Only a few scientists. scientists. Nobody is care about. I don't know. I am, I am here, I travel from Vilnius now, especially looking, what can we do together that we raise questions about, about, because without 
political will to keep health as human right and to keep and ask all politicians, you need to, to think about your first you know, uh, obligation. To, to, and then, of course, sepsis will be in the same line. And then we will can do more, better and more at every level of, of, of situation, local, regional, national, and European parliament level, and European level. And then we will achieve something more, because the figures that you chose is, is shocking. Yeah. In Western Europe, in Western Europe, you see, <laughs> lowest level, in Western Europe. In high-developed in, 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 in high economic developed country. Paradox. Sorry being emotional because no. I you know this touch me. No, we, we, we love your emotion, uh, <laughs> Dr. Andrew Kaitis. I mean, this is exactly what we need to see, I think. Uh, you spoke about um, health as a human right. We should uh, publish awareness around sepsis beyond the Lancet and other, other medical journals, which is obviously uh, as important. Um, so that brings me to my next panelist and the question, are we just speaking to ourselves in a bubble when it comes to sepsis, Dr. Evangelos? What's your take on the presentation uh, before? Well, uh, I am trying since 20 years to elaborate the importance of the concept in my country. Uh, as the time went on, I realized that it's not just my country. I realized that it was a worldwide problem. And if you ask me, why is that? I would like to use a bit my experience of what I realized during the COVID pandemic. Speaking scientifically wise, when it comes to our daily life and we say, how can we develop a definition of sepsis? How can we develop a biomarker of sepsis? How can we develop criteria of sepsis? Then in the very end, always endless discussion, they end up with the same endpoint that you need to surrogate for death. And this is an infection with high likelihood for death. All of a sudden, Always during the years and during human evolution, there are things people love to speak about, things they are very conservative to speak about, and things they never wish to speak about. And the only thing people they never wish to speak about is death. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the reason of the reaction of COVID is because there is fear. Look what happened with COVID in just one night, just because someone published that there is a good outcome if you give a combination of antibiotics in just five patients, all of a sudden, WHO, in, and not the WHO, the Europe, America, all medical societies, in one day they changed their guidelines saying give this to drugs. Why that? Because it was fear which was guiding that. So. The, one of the problems of not this being communicated is that when the patient dies, he dies inside the ICU. And the ICU is a relatively, let's call it closed department. Not many people have access to what is taking place there. That means that the information is not known to everybody. And of course, what is missing to us is to make people understand that the reason why the patient entered the ICU, was admitted to the ICU, it was because there was an extremely prolonged lack of time of recognition. But when you come even to education and you tell to somebody, look, you are responsible about what will happen to this patient after 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, not just as from the point of view of the physician but of the point of view of all her care personnel, from the point of view even of the administrators of the hospital, who cannot sure. distinguish who's the patient who needs to get immediate care and who's the patient who can a bit delay. All this makes a constellation of problems. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the real way to change that, first of all, talking as a physician, is that we need to add in the curriculum of the education 
even from the first year of the medical school, what sepsis is about. It took me as a medical student almost six years, just a few months before, before I graduated from the medical school, to listen a talk about sepsis. So how can you learn something? How can you are be aware of something for which you've never been taught? That's, that's very um, uh, enlightening, thank you, because I thought I'm the only one who didn't know about what sepsis really means as a non-health expert, but even if it's not really properly educated in, in your curricula or future curricula, that obviously poses a problem in itself. But Conrad, I think you wanted to just react on Evangelos' comment. Uh, yeah, I d actually, the problem really is that we, the word sepsis is not used by anybody. And as long it's not understand that it's not only the number one cause of death worldwide and the number one cost driver in our healthcare system, which for the US where we have data, it's 64 billion. Yeah. Yeah? And, uh, and this is not known. And, and that's why uh, even it's, it's a health economic burden, it's a human burden, it declines the workforce for the long term sequela even in high, high income countries and that's why we need to convince and that's both WHO to make it really a priority. Tetros of course speaks when he's invited to a sepsis meeting but if he's not invited to a sepsis meeting and when he speaks <laughs> Uh, about COVID, the word sepsis is not applied. The same is true for our great new Minister of Health in, in Germany. The same thing, he, he spoke at length on co COVID sequela and we need to do something. And I tried to convince since a year his ministry that there is a, not only an overlap, it's almost identical, the, sepsis, the sequela from COVID-19. So it's so hard and, and, and that's why we must not only work with media and their survivors are important, but also to convince the policy makers that they really need to communicate the word. When Stephen, uh, Steve Reeves, the Superman, died from a wound infection of a pressure wound, he, as you know, he was tetraplegic, CNN reported he died from a cardiac arrest. So, so, and, and so things have changed over time. They mentioned when Muhammad Ali died for the first time publicly that it was sepsis. But we're making some progress, but we need to scale up the progress in terms to use the words because even in the Global Burden of Disease Report, 10 years ago, the word sepsis was not present. The main cause of death at this time was lower respiratory tract infections and sepsis was mentioned only with neonatal sepsis. So we have achieved, and that's why it's so important that we work together, that the authors of the Global Burden of Disease Report took up this issue uh, and, 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 and back and so forth. So it's, it's hard work, but it we must not expect from any politicians that they really understand if we are not, if they don't have the dialogue to reality and, and with, with, with the humans, with the people and, and with their healthcare system representatives, etc., etc. So otherwise they follow just their <coughs> internal interests. The cardiologists fight for cardiology. The so neurologists like stroke, Parkinson, etc. And these overarching issues like infectious diseases have no lobby. Neither. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's so. Um, that's um, very powerful. I mean, you know, in the G20 partnership, we have the tuberculosis community. We had them before the sepsis community, the AMR community, the malaria community, and everyone was lobbying for their own right. However, if you synergize and uh, uh, achieve or try to get the attention of policymakers for a common goal, because in the end you want to tackle these infectious diseases, uh, the message changes and becomes more powerful. So silos, we have to break the silos. And with that, I want to come to you. Um, I think um, you heard the interventions of your co-panelists. Um, the silos are a problem. Communication to policymakers, 
problems in hospitals in itself uh, in managing sepsis. So what's your take if you were now to speak to, let's say, the EU Commissioner of Economy and your, uh, uh, pre um, your uh, colleague at the moment, um, uh, the EU Health Commissioner, what would you advise them on how to better manage concerted efforts to tackle sepsis in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> it's again a complicated question. Very sorry. complicated <laughs> question. You know, first of all, I fully agree with my both panelists. Absolutely. Silo mentality is one of the main you know, troubles. Yeah. Because I uh, met a lot of different NGOs in five years. They are fighting for their own niche issues, you know, money, uh, awareness week, and so on, support program. And I ask them, look, you all are together, HIV, hepatitis C, uh, tuberculosis, uh, you know, uh, you all are, are you capable to join your forces to build broader alliance, speaking about infectious diseases and raise those awareness campaigns every year and press very much all politicians at total level? No answer was, nobody is interested. Why? I want, once again, and today, if you are speaking with tuberculosis alliance, they will speak about their problems, HIV, and silo is so difficult, you should overcome it. I don't know what, how can we do. Of course, speaking about, about you know, possibilities to, to discuss e e sepsis issues in broadest context. Look, we have antimicrobial and uh, IMR uh, strategy. Yes? IMR is also one of segments of fighting against yeah, yeah. sepsis. Exactly. Yes, for sure. And we need also to say, yes, look, IMR, infectious diseases, sepsis should align together and need to present, you know, common strategy. You look, uh, this year in September, you will have the high level ministerial meeting at United Nations level, speaking about tuberculosis, speaking about a a a HIV, and, uh, and also universal health coverage. And in universal health coverage you should also include infectious diseases because it is one of the of the main yeah, issues. Yeah. And we need to th think about training, about education, about about all levels involved in two, and also systemic approach and systemic forces. We need now to, to join people to say, hey, look, from different silo uh, uh, areas, please join, please join, once again join. Exactly. And of course, it would be good to, to join WHO forces, U U European Commission forces, and of course, also, once again, to present such very strong, you know, you know message that it is, uh, it's time to unite our forces in this, in this area. Otherwise, we will talk, uh, it's small departments and small bubbles and never overcome uh, exactly. possibilities. Exactly, and I think maybe it's the patient advocacy Maybe I am wrong, well. I don't know, but... but <laughs> no, I think breaking the silos, giving the common messages, the patient uh, advocacy groups maybe can combine such messages, you know, when they speak to policymakers um, in future. However, you mentioned the buzzword that I want to touch on with uh, our other panelists. AMR and COVID was mentioned by you, Evangelos. So when you speak of sepsis, you also have a high correlation with AMR and obviously high correlation with COVID. So um, when, you, when you look at these correlations, what's your take on um, how we can uh, combine these policy actions to, to raise more awareness towards the sepsis problem and uh, make concrete recommendations to European hospitals to tackle? So thank you for that. There are two big options, two, sorry, two big chances that we should not allow them to bypass. Yeah. Okay. The first is that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, government of Cameron in the United uh, Kingdom uh, somewhat 10 years ago, they announced that by the year 2050, almost uh, 25 million people will die each year uh, infected by multidrug resistant bacteria. <coughs> and of course, the common sense behind that is that, look, we will not have drugs to kill the bacteria, so the bacteria, they will kill us. And the question comes, what is the mechanism that bacteria will kill us? And the answer is clear cut. 
it is sepsis. So in other terms, what was the declaration of the UK government was that, look, if you don't stop, if you cannot stop bacteria, they kill you through sepsis. And also we need to take profit from the fact that exactly because there are no new antibiotics, uh, somewhat 15 years ago when uh, Obama was the president of the United States, uh, he announced uh, a help coming from funding from his government to the industries for the immediate start of phase three clinical trials for new antibiotics. So this is exactly from the government and in direct evidence that bacteria, if you allow them to survive a bit, they will kill you. What is missing from that is the link between in lack of efficacy of antibiotics and the end, which is death. And the link is the term sepsis. The other opportunity that we should not miss is COVID-19. If you go to the sepsis definition, the sepsis definition is teaching that in the very end, you have an organ dysfunction leading to death, and this is triggered by an infection. It doesn't say a bacterial infection. It says an infection. Infection means microorganism, and microorganisms are not just bacteria. Viruses are microorganisms as well. So what was COVID? Lethal organ dysfunction as a result of a viral infection. So it fully adheres to the definition of sepsis. Absolutely. So if we, and that's my point of view, if we try in a very simplistic way to say to the world that, look, antimicrobial resistance and death is, there is similar their meaning to sepsis and COVID. What we have experienced is sepsis events, but we need to say that in a very simplistic way to make people fully understand that, mm. to remind them the fear they had at the beginning of the pandemic, then I believe that we may increase our chances. Thank you. Thank you, Evangelos. Do you want to add on that? Yes, uh, uh, we definitely need to synchronize this because I fully believe that 10 to 100 times more patients die although they, because they don't get available antimicrobials and effective antimicrobials because mostly the diagnosis is not made. But also when I discuss with general practitioners and also with hospital physicians on the need that sepsis needs to be treated as an emergency like heart attack and stroke, they say, and what about antimicrobial resistance? After having spoken half an hour on the burden of sepsis, there is still a fear because in some way there is a cross imbalance between the true situation that even if you are not right and you treat for two or three days uh, severely ill patients with a viral sepsis and then correct this will add almost nothing to an increase in AMR. And due to the fact that somebody like Blair, who was at this time a superstar on the globe, AMR has made it and has resulted that every Minister of Health in the world has a department on AMR. WHO has an Assistant Director General on AMR but they have not a single person within um, the WHO and no single Ministry of Health who understands that the final common pathway from all infections, most 95% of it is sepsis and this has implications. So, the, so, so this tells you how decisions, structures are driven by Top down. If WHO not only we, we needed to push WHO to get there, and it was by chance, yeah. Uh, and I don't want to de 
to, to go in detail. So this is how decisions are made on the global and the national level. And we need to overcome, and this is the only chance to do it with the facts, the global burden of AMR uh, aspect. God came out with one million deaths attributable to AMR. And every, uh, uh, we know that those people who die with AMR, who have AMR, mostly are severely immunocompromised patients because AMR sen sensitive or AMR pathogens, they lose their vitality. That's why they are not dangerous for otherwise healthy patients. So that's, that's the situation. So this is poorly understand. And the people have heard these 50 million who will die annually in 2030. Nobody at WHO believes this number, but still, and this was expressed to me, uh, but still they stick to their current structures and are not able to adapt really their policy and their structures to the real numbers. So that, that's, um, yeah. Thank you, Conrad. Um, do you want to... If I may, <coughs> speaking about WHO, you know, WHO is a very strange, a very organization which has no implementing powers. We uh, can provide only recommendations, guidelines, assistance, analysis, and so on and so on, because it's up to, up to uh, member states and to their governments to have implementing powers. WHO is represented of, of a European program of work, 2020-2025. You can find all articles related to IMR, sepsis, related to vaccination, of, but immunization programs are in the hands of member states. Look at immunization, look at situation to, to, to prevent. We need to, to discuss about effective vaccines and vaccination, about immunization program. But what is on the ground? Yeah. On the ground, you can see so, you know, so difficult pictures, speaking, frankly speaking. Yeah. But still, and this I know from our colleagues around the world, for example, also from Brazil, uh, Flavia Machado, who, who really has done a great job in Latin America, says, we cannot reach our government, and this is 10 years ago, in contrast to AMR, as long as WHO does not provide, and the United Nations, uh, sepsis the same priority as it has been doing with AMR. So, so that's why it's so badly needed that also within, and, and we are making progress on the level of uh, uh, WHO, but it's still pretty hard. Yeah, so, but, but it's a good time also to raise question. Now, we are sitting here, we are all Europeans now. Now is a very good time to understand that we need to raise questions about possibilities to strengthen health dimension at EU level. Lisbon Treaty is very weak. European Commission has no tools to provide much more, uh, you know, uh, uh, effective measures at, at European level. Please, now we have good good window for opportunity. It's cross border healthcare threats. Yep. And we need to use such opportunity to raise also sepsis as cross border healthcare threats. And maybe it can help us to, to raise those voices much loudly and also raise questions about possibilities to, to, to build Euro real European health union. Just the opportunity you mentioned, I love the debate. <laughs> it's good that you're engaging. Um, the, the point you mentioned on Europe has, now it's the time to give some suggestions and provide tools. We have the new European, or not so new anymore, but the EU health strategy uh, and the digital health strategy. And a key component, I think, in Europe, what we have is we are information rich, but data poor. Uh, I recently had a conversation with the EU Commission official um, who was uh, at, the, at your former department and they were saying to me that especially um, countries like Germany, they fail to get data on hospitalization beds, um, patients who are infected by AMR to, in order to assess basically where the burden is. So I'm thinking out loud here, and I'm throwing this back to you uh, on this data question. Is it maybe a fear, European wide or national wide or in hospitals, to look at the data on sepsis and then be afraid as a hospital 
that you have so many sepsis cases potentially which uh, will um, affect your reputation as a hospital uh, or as a country. So you rather do not show the data and that complies with AMR as well, by the way. But maybe that can be a major burden. I'm just thinking from a social aspect here. And following from that, and I will give it to you how you want to answer, what is the value of data? Because I recently met a startup um, in Germany. They said to me, uh, within 10 hours before a patient is developing symptoms towards sepsis, we can see through our AI algorithms in the ICU beds that the patient is developing sepsis. So coming to diagnosis and care. So I have two components, the lack of data and not wanting to show data because of these problems and the value of future AI and data. So who wants to talk about well, this? Well, if I may start. Yeah. Before addressing the negative uh, point uh, of this question, because not having data or not wanting to show data has a not inside. That means a negative meaning. The real uh, question is, what is the proper action in order to have access to the data. Regarding AMR, one action is that you ask the microbiology department to provide their data. These data do exist. And there is the Euro surveillance, and these are connected to the CDC for all the countries. So information about AMR does exist. Why? Because all computers of all microbiology departments are linked so automatically once you have through the computers a reply there is a central gathering of the data mm. but then it comes what is the impact of antimicrobial resistance in the outcome of the patient in other terms we know that there is antimicrobial resistance but we don't know if the patients they developed sepsis and whether they died these are information which is impossible through uh, an electronic system to be collected. Why that? Because you need someone to upload the data. And the one who will upload the data is the physician, the attending physician, who is taking care of the patient. But in order to allow uploading of the data, you need to generate ample time to do that. So it cannot be a hobby collecting the data. You cannot ask young people and young fellows who are spending uh, 10 or 12 hours in hospitals to give another one hour to upload the data. So you, you need to find administrator-wise an approach to collect the very simple information. Mm -hmm. What was the clinical impact of antimicrobial resistance? So it's not that the systems, they feel ashamed to share the data. It's not that there is no data. It is that there is a very objective difficulty and we need to find a way to persuade that we need to reinforce manpower in order to collect the data. Thank you. Uh, let me answer to this last one. I think digitalization is really the key word here because if you have all the information and this is there in and the US have demonstrated and others so you 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 can see from the lab value from the treatment who, who and this has been done in the US and it published in uh, five years ago you see these based on the health record electronic you see these patients was has septic with 95% certainty. If you look at this data, it turned out it's three times higher than as it was documented by administrators in the ICD, International Classification of Diseases. So that's one issue. But what you raised also, is there fear from data? I would say, it, I can only speak for Germany, there's no interest. Because mm. yeah, we don't have not only a problem, our myocardial infection, deaths from myocardial infections in Germany, there are only three countries uh, who have higher than 8% hospital mortalities. I don't mention them here in Europe, but there are five where it's lower than or 4%. 
in a country like Germany, no other country has more ICU beds. No other country has uh, more he has heart catheterization uh, uh, facilities, etc. So we have not, and and there's only one country who has more nurses. Uh, in Europe, this is Finland, than Germany. So we have not a resource problem, we have a quality problem. And that's, they fear this. And that's why I, for, there was some time I was a great enemy uh, for the Ministry of Health, at least under one Minister of Health. Uh, who, when I asked him the question, why, how come uh, that we are there, he said, Jeremy, and why is it different in UK? He said, Jeremy Hunt owns the hospital. So it, it's because in Germany, the system is left to the discretion of the physicians and the insurers. So they are all interested. So, so we have a political issue here. But yeah. coming to your question again, yes, AI is very helpful in the hospital, but we must also recognize that 80% of the cases developed in the community. But also we general practitioners can have, we have developed now a sepsis checklist and mm -hmm. this could, can be implemented in there uh, also at, at, at a GPD level and, and we, you can provide a nurse and uh, uh, assistant in the, in a, at the, to, to have a checklist for sepsis, so etc. So it's doable but there must be a, a, a will and of course digitalization is, is key and is a big opportunity, but alone it won't. <laughs> we will get better numbers, but but to, to have also other systems like rapid response systems and and, 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 and back and so forth. So, but if I may, I will add a little bit. I fully agree with what you said about about the possibilities to to collect data using IT technologies and programs. Of course, of course. Also speaking about hospital management and possibilities to to have standardized data in. All 27 member states, for example, all hospitals, knowing that yes, we need, to, we, we have in our hands, you know, hospital management, standardized hospital management, where possibilities to in, to collect information about uh, about sepsis is introduced into management, into hospital management system, because it, it, it but it is it require foundation funds, it require money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Please look right. now, speaking about European Union budget, now you have uh, EU for health. Five billion euros, yes? Five billion. Four billion are dedicated to cancer. Four billion yeah. to yeah. cancer. It's about lobby. Yeah. That's all. But please look at the European Commission proposed to European Council to have budget 10 billion. You remember? And European Council decided to, you know, disagree and propose to have 1.2 billion from 10 and only after European Parliament press to, to, to in, the, in the trio, they agree, accepted to raise questions still 5 billion. Now we are speaking about possibilities to, to finance sepsis yeah. program and to finance data and to build, you know, strong, you know, IT platform which can help us to mm -hmm. collect. But please look into financial issues. You see political determinants in the, in the yeah, health. Yeah. Well, exactly. Now, speaking of, I will take like one or two questions, um, just trying to close off the panel. Uh, in terms of what you mentioned, um, budgets are constrained. We have multifaceted challenges right now. Health is falling down the global agenda, right? It's not as important um, post-COVID anymore. And that's why we always have to fight to make the case of why we need more financing to early prevent um, sepsis or early diagnosis or better quality improvement systems like Christian mentioned. So I think key takeaways from my side is we need to empower healthcare workers um, and we need to have better quality improvement programs. We need to have more hospitals um, 
sharing the data with your survey so we can identify the gaps. We also need to show to policymakers the cost of not investing into sepsis prevention Absolutely. now, because if I hear that annually around 62 to 64 billion in the US are being spent on sepsis treatment, uh, I would like to know what that number would account to in Europe. And the cost of not inventing um, Investing now has detrimental effects afterwards, and we should we should really learn the lesson from that. However, uh, having like all the different perspectives and great insights from you, I would like to know from you, like within like two three sentences. I know it's very complicated again, uh, <laughs> Commissioner, but I would like to know um, if you were to speak to the EU Health Commissioner tomorrow, and you have the national plans on sepsis. Um, what would you advise the commissioner in saying, hey, this is a low hanging fruit. This is what we can implement in the next few months in Europe as a joint effort to tackle sepsis. <laughs> what would that uh, First be? of all, yeah. I, I can tell you just yeah. Stella Kirikidis, she did do very excellent job. Yeah. I fully understand now concerns and now un, un, uh, constraints, sorry, and at, at, at European Commission level. Now we have war in Ukraine. Why in Ukraine? It uh, requires additional money. And that money was not in, 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 in multi-annual financial framework, not in budget. They try to, and, in, and for Stella, it's so difficult time. COVID, war, you know, migration and so on. And, 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 to, and, and of course also, please keep in mind that agenda at council level depends on governments of European Union, not on, uh, from, not on, uh, on Stella Kyriakidis. Yeah. She can propose what she wish, but they can say, say, sorry, we are not interested because we have a lot of common uh, problems, you know, at, at home, but sorry, but we are gathering only two times per, per, per year uh, as, as, commi as ministers of health. And then we ask about, uh, ministers of economy, what does it mean, economic consequences, not to act uh, 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 preventing uh, infectious diseases? They can tell you nothing. They do not understand what does it mean, a, a, a cost of, of, of a pandemic or, a, 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 or, of a, or epidemic. And they are so silo speaking about, about pre budget related to, 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 to possibility to finance preventative measures. What can I ask you? Nothing. I, I, see. I am fully, you know, in, in, I am not now, you know, not na na naive. I know very well, uh, you know, everyday agenda of ministers of economy, of ministers of finance. So fire health is far from their, you know, attention in, 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 in you know, it's, it's reality. Yeah. We need to change absolutely. Health in all policies is only empty slogan. Yeah. We, we all are in favor to accept health in all policies. But please ask ministers of finance, do you do something to, in, to, to, you know, to invest more in prevention? Please show annual budget. You can calculate how many money are they dedicating to preventative measures. One or point two, Less. two percent. That's all. Yeah. But not 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 achieving minimum seven level seven percent of of of, of the budget now. So, it's, it's very difficult so to, to, to propose to Stella Kiriakidis to do something more. She do a very excellent job, so, but, but sorry. She so is, then what I'm hearing from you supporting your colleague, <laughs> ex-colleague, um, I would say then the lesson is we need to speak targeted uh, to governments and look where the sepsis burden is perhaps high and show to these finance ministers why they should be investing yes, into sepsis long term to put health again at the center stage. That could be an option. And then we yes, come to absolutely. the commissioner and say, absolutely. look, this is uh, our result. <laughs> we need to but, ask the yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Council of Ministers of Finance yeah. when they are discussing and issues about health at European Union exactly. level. Where is on the agenda this question? Exactly. Question one, number one. Yeah. I'm conscious of our time, so uh, we have uh, the last uh, two speakers and then I need to close the session. So over to Evangelos and Conrad. I am in favor of education in all levels of healthcare providers. I believe that's what we need to start off. Thank so you. that's the second key message. Thank you. I would recommend uh, to any politician to go with numbers 
and, and uh, recommend to us uh, that the difference between success and failure is persistence. And we have only come to this where we are right now and we have made pro tremendous progress over the last 10 years. This tells us it's not impossible because we, the, the, the economy, the human burden at the health economy is with us and our, our numbers. And this is the <coughs> only way we have generated the numbers. We have tried to make them public, and our only chance is to bring these numbers to the attention and to get involvement of survivors and their families. So that's all we have, and we know how it works. And so that's it. I think okay. uh, we, let's on that let, note. Yeah, uh, let's I, be I optimistic. Exactly. Let's be optimistic. I think that's the key message. There is a lot of work to do. I thank my uh, panelists today for the passionate interventions. I think it was one of the most passionate sepsis discussions I've been in. So thank you. Um, I hope that uh, you share the passion uh, with the panelists and. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&As, but you can ask the panelists in the lunch break, hopefully. And uh, thank you for listening to us. Uh, we will start with two talks uh, about two different groups of patients, and that is the elderly and children. Uh, and we will start with the elderly. Uh, I would like to welcome up Antonio Artigas from Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Uh, who will talk more about uh, the impact of sepsis uh, on elderly critically ill patients. So please welcome up Mr. Antigas. Thank you, Ulrika. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to me to be here uh, to present some data that uh, I will uh, show you, uh, especially after the uh, the last presentation that really, uh, when you look on the results in Europe, uh, is really not very pleasant. No? <laughs> so uh, in the next 10 minutes, I will uh, show you some data uh, from Europe uh, on the impact of sepsis in elderly critical ill patients. I don't have any uh, disclosures uh, related to this presentation. And uh, that I will try to review with you some epidemiologic data, the concept of immunosensors, and the data from the, the group of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, the BIP uh, study. Uh, and I will uh, show you the data of the two uh, studies uh, done by this group. And finally, some uh, message. So the the problem of uh, aging uh, in our ICU is that we are admitting more and more and more patients, elderly patients. And uh, it's uh, the idea, uh, well, this is the consequences because the, the distribution of the population in all uh, European countries uh, changed enormously. So the pyramid is now the reverse. And, uh, and it seems that probably, uh, the expectation is that in, in the 2040, probably 40% 40 of our patients admitted in our uh, university hospital will be uh, patients high, uh, with an age older than 65 per, uh, years. So, and this means that uh, it's really a big problem and the health system should be adapted to this, uh, to this reality, you know? Uh, and when you look on the data, for example, these are data that, uh, of a study that we did with Charlie Sprung many years ago. And you see that uh, the, uh, when you look on the different range of age and patients accepted or refused, the, uh, the older you are, the higher is incidence of patients that are rejected uh, to be admitted in the ICU. And this is again another problem. Uh, some years ago, uh, Greg Martin uh, in the uh, in, in United States, he shows that, or he demonstrated that in, in the ICUs in the United States, that the elderly patients with an age uh, higher than 65, 
the incidence is increasing along the, the years. Uh, if you compare with uh, younger patients with sepsis, that uh, the incidence uh, didn't change. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, proportion of surviving, uh, if you compare patients, uh, older patients with uh, younger patients, uh, elderly patients uh, has a higher or a lower survival rate and a higher mortality if you compare with younger patients. Probably you, you can say, this is not new, we know this. But uh, there are not uh, too many information about uh, the group of uh, elderly patients uh, with sepsis. So what are the factors that contribute the, to the high incidence of sepsis and mortality in all patients? And there are many. Uh, one is the immunosensors, or that we call the inflammation. These patients, they have an immunodepression, and the response of the, immunity, of the immune system is different if you compare with young patients. Uh, and this is especially clear, and it was very well demonstrated in uh, lung diseases. Uh, these patients, they have a poor nutritional status, they have many comorbidities, they have a long, low physiologic reserve, and uh, these patients are, they have also resistant strains uh, that, uh, I mean, facilitate uh, the incidence of, uh, or, or to increase the incidence of sepsis. And, and also, uh, it, that is very important, is these patients, the manifestation, the clinical manifestation, the symptoms are different as the younger patients. These patients, uh, uh, they have, uh, sometimes they have no fever, no leukocytosis, no tachycardia, no capillary dilatation, because uh, the vascular system is different as the younger uh, patients. And, uh, and also, uh, these patients uh, receive a multi uh, a medication. So these are the factors that probably can explain, uh, or multi factors uh, that uh, explain the high incidence of sepsis in elderly patients. So uh, because uh, really this uh, we uh, we thought that the, it was uh, a really a big problem. Uh, we decided in, uh, in a group uh, of the European Society of Intensive Care uh, Medicine uh, to create a network uh, of a group of, uh, of ICUs uh, to work on uh, and to uh, analyze much better uh, the data of uh, elderly patients admitted in, the, in our ICUs. And uh, this... Uh, include 21 uh, countries uh, with more than 5,000 5, patients that were recruited uh, in, uh, in all European uh, countries. And uh, for the general elderly patients uh, that we found that the Fratelli uh, was uh, probably the most important uh, pronostic factor in these patients, especially in those that are they have uh, an acute disease, but it was not the case for the scheduled surgery, probably because they are a pre-selection of these patients uh, that were included, admitted in the ICU. So uh, then uh, we were interested uh, to look on the different uh, specific uh, etiologies or diseases in, the, is in these elderly patients admitted in the ICU. We analyze uh, patients with acute respiratory failure, uh, patients with uh, trauma, et cetera, et cetera, and of course, patients with sepsis. And uh, we did two studies. Uh, the, this was the first study that was published in the uh, in the Annals of Intensive Care Medicine, and this is the second uh, study that we did uh, on uh, patients with sepsis, and I will try to summarize and put together the data of the two studies. So the two studies, uh, you see that uh, this is the 
the total number of patients included uh, in this uh, in this cohort, and uh, the patients uh, 14 per, uh, 40 percent uh, had their sepsis as admission di uh, diagnosis in uh, in the in the BIP two study uh, in the BIP one study, sorry, and. Uh, and uh, the, well, in both uh, studies, you see that uh, the distribution of uh, sex, uh, it were 55% uh, were male, but frailly, 40, uh, close to half of the patients were frail. The SOFA score uh, was uh, nine, so they were severe uh, patients. And uh, uh, the close to majority of the patients receive uh, vasoactive drugs, uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, 48%, the non-invasive me mechanical ventilation, 90%, and renal replacement therapy, uh, close to 20%. They stay in the ICU four days, and uh, limitation of uh, treatment um, by with withholding and uh, withdrawing 29% uh, and 15%. That means that uh, there's a large uh, number of patients that uh, they were uh, associated uh, with uh, a limitation of uh, this, uh, the, uh, the treatment uh, of these patients. And the mortality in the ICU was 31% at 30 days in the BIP-1 on the first study and 45% in the, at six months, uh, you see it's uh, 54%. So uh, that means that uh, the mortality rate in these patients uh, were quite high. And then we were interested to, <coughs> to see uh, what were uh, the independent pronostic factors in these studies. And uh, to do this, uh, we did uh, a multivariate analysis using the Cox uh, pro prognosis uh, uh, analysis. And uh, of course, uh, the older are the patients, the age was one of the predicted factor. The freightly, again, uh, also. Uh, the severity of the uh, disease, uh, according to the severity of organ dysfunction also was related uh, with uh, pronostic factor, but not the sepsis. So when we analyze the sepsis by itself, we didn't find uh, a significant uh, relationship. So uh, just to complete uh, and to uh, emphasize on this uh, uh, data, is uh, we did uh, the, uh, the survival curve in both the studies, in the B1 and the B2. Uh, these are survival curves uh, adjusted by the confounding factors. And you see there is no differences between uh, elderly patients with sepsis and elderly patients without sepsis with the same SOFA score, I mean the same severity score. So just uh, to summarize the, the, the data and the conclusions is that uh, the very old patients admitted uh, with sepsis has a quite high uh, mortality, but sepsis is not independently associated with mortality in these two studies. Frankly, the age uh, of these patients and the higher severity are independent and are the, the independent uh, pronostic factors that uh, and we need to take in account uh, in order to decide uh, the different uh, therapeutic strategies. I think uh, uh, we need uh, further research uh, in regard to validate uh, a predictive model and to define the optimal approach to these uh, elderly uh, patients who survive uh, to a sepsis. And, uh, Probably in the future, we are thinking uh, to do uh, triage uh, treatment in these patients and to, that could be uh, useful for us uh, to uh, also communicate uh, 
the uh, potential uh, or the pronostics uh, to these patients to the families. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks. I think this is an important study because you may remember that we also as GSA had a controversy with a famous uh, intensivist from United Kingdom who in some way claimed and complained on this, what he, they, they called sepsis hype. Uh, and um, the main argument being that, and quoting even in this uh, statement in The Lancet, that pneumonia forever was the old man's best friend in, in terms of having to die. And, and, uh, and of course, so we had to rebattle and, and your data confirms that sepsis per se is not uh, yeah, just to give, give up. Uh, of course, we should not prolong uh, dying um, uh, with intensive care unit, but we must give those of the elderly who have sepsis a chance. Uh, that's why I think it's, yeah. it's important. No, no, I fully agree with you. And, uh, and there is another problem is that uh, elderly patients are absolutely discriminated in all the randomized control trials. So uh, the, in randomized control trials, uh, the patients uh, older than 75 or 80, uh, 80, 80 years are not included. So new drugs we don't know uh, if they will be effective in these patients that they have an immunodepression, etc., etc. So uh, I think in the because of the number of the the incidence of these patients admitted in ICU is increasing, this uh, uh, strategy uh, should be a change in the future. Yeah, Ron. thanks, uh, Antonio. Thank you so much for a great presentation. I just wanted, firstly, to expand on Comrade's point for those trying to persuade people in their own countries to take sepsis very seriously. If you look at the New York State data for 2018, almost half of adults in that study were working age adults and more than 50% of children were school age children. So I think we've got some good international data to show that this is not just the very old and the very, very young. Um, uh, yeah, secondly, uh, certainly in the UK, the goalposts have moved and I think it's, it's reasonable and acceptable to admit someone to intensive care, even if they're being palliated for a long term condition, if we can get those people home uh, for a valuable few weeks and months with their families toward the end of life. Do you think we need to sort of change the messaging around what intensive care offers and stop looking to only saving lives, but also look to prolonging lives with high quality. Uh, absolutely. I, I think it's, uh, I mean, the decision to be admitted uh, or to prolong the treatment is uh, you need uh, first to have uh, a good communication with the relatives and the patient, if he's uh, conscious, and uh, to explain uh, the consequences of the treatment and the potential benefit. And uh, the decision should be taken according uh, with the, the belief of the patient and the wishes of the, uh, of the relatives, uh, absolutely. And, but this, this is not just only for uh, elderly patients, I think it's a, it's a general concept uh, today uh, that we call more humanized uh, ICU treatment. I think, uh, thank you so much, Antonio, for this really interesting uh, presentation. <clears throat> we will uh, continue uh, and invite um, Dr. Loren Slapach from the University Children's Hospital in Zurich. We will talk more about sepsis in children and he will expand on the, this, uh, this subject, targeting quality improvement uh, in sepsis care to meet the needs of children and their families. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Oren Schlappach from the University Children's Hospital in Zurich um, and part of the European Sepsis Alliance um, board. I have no other conflicts of interest to declare. So we've heard about you know, sepsis towards the end of life. Now we're going to focus on sepsis at the beginning of life. The next slide, please. 
So what's important is, um, next slide, please. Yeah. So um, clinicians or parents you know, caring for children very, very often see children that have fever or any type of mild infections. Overall, very few of those progress to sepsis, but those that do progress actually can do so very, very quickly and very fundamentally. And so tragically, most cases when a child dies of sepsis, actually the, the root cause investigation will reveal that these parents have presented several times usually to different healthcare providers in the in preceding days, usually by a sense of feeling actually something is wrong here. So the question really is where the sepsis start and what can we do? How big is the problem for children? Next slide, please. When you look at the global burden of sepsis, what you can see here is that globally, pretty much 50% of sepsis cases affect pediatric and neonatal age groups, so roughly 25 million. This leads to over 3 million deaths globally. Now, this, of course, includes a lot of data from low middle income countries. But um, even when you look at actually country specific data of the global burden of disease, you can see actually that sepsis across all great age groups ranks as one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality. Next slide, please. For Europe, we do not have at present um, very detailed epidemiological data available other than the global burden of disease study. There's one paper from Germany, from Caroline uh, Fleischmann's uh, group, which had, has shown that if you only look at patients where sepsis was used as an explicit code, then you still find that it's present in about one, one out of a thousand hospitalizations. That probably is a, a gross underestimation actually of the true burden. But what you can see as well is that not only has actually that burden not dropped substantially over past years, but it affects all age groups and the mortality remains significant, in particular as well if children have other comorbidities. Most importantly, these numbers actually not only do they underestimate the true numbers of sepsis, but as well they usually do not account the long-term burden of sepsis. And on the next slide, you're going to see a recent U.S. study which tried to substantiate actually the, the impact of sepsis on uh, longer term outcomes. So what you can see here is that 13 percent, so roughly you know, one, in, one in six to one in, in seven children that have had sepsis, they, they, they will develop six months after sepsis uh, a new chronic condition which usually will persist. So these conditions actually will have a major impact on, on the health-related quality of life for the child and the family, but as well, they will really economically burden our societies because they will result in very long-term costs. And finally, as well, we should remember that the average child with sepsis is less than five years of age. So um, long-term consequences in children, they, they may have an effect for up to 80 years long, not only on this child, but as well on his siblings, on its parents, on future offspring. And so despite the lower numbers of pediatric sepsis, there is a multiplying effect of tremendous relevance for the society. What you can see as well here, and that's the lower number, is that the proportion of children with sepsis, they have underlying comorbidities already before they present with sepsis. But sepsis greatly uh, increases the se severity of those, and roughly one in five will develop add-on or progressive conditions actually after sepsis. So it is a major issue, not only for previously healthy children, but as well for children with existing comorbidities. Next slide, please. Now, when we look at investigations as to um, why children with sepsis died, for example, the, you find reports from the UK, from France, the, um, from Australia, from the US. The, um, the tragic situation is that you find patterns which repeat themselves. Um, on one side, we see pa patients which are socially vulnerable or were, for example, you know, they're disadvantaged based on social economics, for example, or because of physical vulnerabilities. But very, very often there is a, a delay in recognizing sepsis, which starts in the community, sometimes at the interaction of families with community healthcare workers, but often that actually continues then even when they present to hospital. And even when sepsis is recognized, very often there are still delays to to actually um, treatment, such as, you know, timely antibiotics and delays to escalation, which for children is extremely relevant because if a child presents to a small facility, which usually may, may not be very specialized for children, and there are delays in actually establishing IV access or in giving antibiotics, this can have massive consequences. And all in all, actually, for many other diseases, we would not be willing to accept such for children. 
And so all this really comes back to we have a certain willingness to accept this in sepsis, what we would not do in other cases. Because actually children are, are, are often scattered across different institutions, individual exposure to large sepsis numbers may not be there. So uh, clinicians may tend to under-recognize the problem. They're usually under-trained for the problem. Um, and it can be really tricky as well to recognize these cases outside in you know, a large number of children that have other types of infections. But most importantly, actually, some of these challenges, um, for example, in the case of oncological um, patients that start having complications, we've shown that this can be overcome by proper targeted education of parents and caregivers and by proper pathways, which actually allow to improve the quality of care. So it is now time that we do so more broadly in Europe for children with sepsis too. Next slide, please. And this, you know, really takes us back to the first opportunities to pick up sepsis, which usually is the, um, the community. Then what we too often forget is that parents are experts of their children. And so we have to educate parents on what sepsis is. Um, surveys done in Australia and the UK and Germany indicate actually that a very large number of not only the, the broad population, but a very large number of parents have never properly heard about sepsis and they are not capable to recognize signs of sepsis in their child. So it's something which we have to improve on. The second point is to a degree sepsis has, is a socioeconomic disease too, which means that in particular the disadvantaged, disadvantaged families, we have to in particular you know, target with these campaigns. Because um, children cannot um, manifest for themselves and say and voice, you know, I feel sick. Children usually they just get quiet. They adapt their behavior and they can compensate for a very long time before they actually you know decompensate. And so it's it's key that we educate a safety netting around the children, be that the family, the school, or, or public health care workers. And as we all know, in many European countries, so, socioeconomic challenges in the past years have been rather on the, on the rise, implying actually we need better strategy to address such. Next slide, please. Yeah. But once a child presents to hospital, actually, then it's important that, that as well healthcare workers are properly uh, informed. These are just some, some examples that we used in the, in, in the campaign in Australia, because we realized that actually the education even of healthcare workforce triage nurses, for example, as well as other healthcare members for sepsis is not that, that good. And that medical students, for example, they may learn about sepsis, but they, they often do not learn about sepsis quality improvement. Next slide, please. The, um, it's been pretty much five years now that the first reports from New York State have shown the dramatic impact achieved in New York State through sepsis mandates. And you know, nowadays it would not be acceptable in a, in a patient with trauma or chest pain or stroke to spend hours before actually certain treatment is launched. But in sepsis, this, this still happens way too often. Next slide. And what has been shown in New York is that the effect on child mortality um, simply by delivering a sepsis bundle you know, within, within the hour of the recognition of sepsis and septic shock has a tremendous impact. So New York State has achieved a 41% mortality reduction if clinicians delivered that bundle within a time frame. So that's something we certainly should all aspire to. Next slide, please. But the problem in doing so is that different hospitals actually do not perform at the same level. And so in order to achieve actually substantial improvements across different European countries, different healthcare systems, different hospitals, it is really essential that we help each other in exchanging, you know, um, uh, works that can lead to this, but in particular as well that we set benchmarks which help actually to, to propagate um, sustained quality improvement in this field. Next slide, please. One way to do so actually can be, you know, national sepsis action plans. And this is an overview of sort of the brainstorm that we've done last year around the design of the Swiss sepsis national action plan where we, we, we discuss through in the multidisciplinary panel from prevention to early detection and treatment through to survivor support, which dimensions need to be taken care of and which are particularly important on um, strategies to focus on. But what's important is that most national action plans actually they do not have a particular focus on children. And next slide, please. And for such, I think it's important that we think through very, very specifically, same as for example, the in an elderly population, you know, what are specific requirements for a pediatric population? 
Children have a unique dependency on the community and parents as experts. So we need to target those in awareness campaigns. We need to make sure that these can actually recognize signs of deterioration. We need to think as well that pediatric is not just delivered in pediatric institutions. There are many children who will first present to an institution where they will be seen by a doctor who primarily has focused on adults. So how do we get that message across? How do we deal with lower numbers, not just in terms of exposure, but as well in terms of measuring performance? Although, as we see increasing, actually the impact is massive. And finally, as well, um, as I've mentioned, you know, children experience sex is at an extremely vulnerable age of their brain development. So they have unique long-term outcome needs and post-sepsis support needs, which you have to tackle. And finally, of course, this is, a, this is a patient group which cannot advocate for themselves and for which usually there are actually no, no industry support um, strategies available. So with this in mind, and that's the last line, the next slide, please, then, you know, I, I really invite you, you know, remember that if we can prevent a child developing such severe sepsis as in this as in this case we can make a tremendous difference not only for this child and its family but for the whole society so thank you all for engaging in that is there any questions for Laurent? yes here we go is this on yes it's on Thank you. It was a great presentation and very inspiring. And um, how did you get the government involved in this uh, national action plan? Um, were they coordinating or uh, are they just members of the committee? I've experienced the national action plan in Australia, um, which were the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare was involved, and this has now led over several years to actually a national standard. In Switzerland, the government was not involved last year when we made the National Action Plan, but government representatives were part of the group. And at present, we're actually working with, with, um, with a commission from the government to see if this could really be implemented through a national program. So it's, it's too early to say. Um, I think you, your question points to, towards a very key point. Very often these initiatives, they come from families, from clinicians or from academia. Um, but we need as well um, leverage of the, the governmental side here. Yeah. Any more questions for Lorraine? Or otherwise we will thank you so much for joining us and a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, we have touched upon this subject before in the first panel, um, the economical impact that sepsis has uh, not only on a, uh, due to the healthcare, the really expensive healthcare um, treatments when, when it comes to sepsis, but also the long-term effects uh, that many patients suffer from uh, um, problems having to go back to work and so on uh, and um, this cost for society in general as, as a whole both when it comes to the healthcare and and as, as uh, on a societal level is something that we have uh, recognized in the ECA and we have also decided that we would like to uh, make a, a really broad European kind of cost estimate uh, assessment study. Uh, um, and as I think it was Conrad was talking about this before also that really to be able to go to the decision makers and, and uh, make them understand exactly how, how broad this, this uh, economical impact, uh, how, how big of a problem it is. And to do this, we have started in some uh, dialogue with the different uh, with, um, uh, partners that can help us uh, make such a study happen. But this, of course, will cost us money. So this is really our um, call, uh, call out for um, companies who might be able to be support us uh, in this uh, endeavor. And uh, if you would like to help us to finance such a study, please talk to us after the meeting or uh, give us a call or uh, send us an email. We are really uh, keen on getting some, some companies on board on this to, to, do, to make this study happen. Okay, so we have uh, reached uh, the point where we're going to talk the final panel and uh, 
Uh, it's going to be about the lessons learned from the COVID pandemic, uh, what, how, how the, we can use this knowledge uh, in, in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, coming, upcoming fight against sepsis. And Ron uh, from uh, UK Sepsis Trust, Ron Daniels, will lead us through this as a moderator. Uh, and I will, I will ask you, Ron, to, um, you know, present the, the rest of the participants in this. And some, some, some will be on the screen, so it's going to be a sort of a, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, to, and just to echo to <laughs> potential you. industry supporters in the room um, with Ulrika's call to action, uh, uh, for which I thank you, and this is really important work, but just so we fully understand some of the preliminary work in the UK and other countries suggests that the burden to society in terms of the cost of sepsis is around seven times higher than the direct cost to healthcare. If we were armed as an international community with the power of those data, it would make our lobbying, lobbying activities very much easier. So thank you. So th this is very much a hybrid session now. We're going to run it for the full hour um, with slight apologies that we're late. It's hybrid for two reasons. Uh, firstly, some of our colleagues are joining us online. <laughs> Um, and secondly, that unlike the previous session, we have a hybrid of short presentations and panel discussion. So um, I will introduce the, I was going to introduce panelists one by one, but since everybody's here, I will introduce our panelists all at once. So uh, on the screen now, you can see uh, Carolyn, um, Carolyn fleischmann Strusek. To those of us who've been working in the sepsis space for many years, Carolyn needs zero introduction. Um, she's a, a physician and an academic at Jena University. Um, and sh without Carolyn, I, I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't have the global data that we have on the epidemiology and disease burden of sepsis. It's, uh, it's thanks to her that we have the global burden of sepsis report. Um, also, I did see uh, Tiago Villanueva, uh, who is online somewhere. Uh, Tiago is a GP. He's not with us for a very good reason. It's the birthday of his general practice, and so they are celebrating the, uh, the surgery's birthday today. Um, uh, Tiago is also um, editor-in-chief of the Portuguese Medical Journal and associate editor of um, the British Medical Journal, as well as vice president of the European Union of GPs. And in the room, we, we have to my, to my far right, um, uh, Christina, who is here because she is a sepsis survivor and through that established the Swedish Sepsis Society. Um, I have the name on the other page and I will refer to the name shortly. Um, uh, but uh, Christina is also well qualified to be here, having worked internationally in the pharmaceutical industry for, for many years. And then we're going to start today with a short presentation from Eje. Um, Oschelik, who um, is a health economist, uh, economist and policy um, analyst and advisor at the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. And I think, Ajay, you're going to share some slides. Thank you again for welcoming us to OECD to this event. Uh, I'm a health economist at the OECD, and my work primarily focuses on communicable diseases at the OECD countries, as well as the EU EEA countries. <laughs> Uh, the work that I will be presenting to you today will be uh, very much focused on antimicrobial resistance AMR, but with some discussions that we would like to bring to the, discussion, uh, to the table around sepsis management uh, within the context of COVID-19 management. So in our research at OECD, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic both underpinned but also undermined policies to tackle healthcare-acquired infections as well as uh, resistant infections making it very difficult to assess the overall impact of the pandemic on sepsis management. To give you a couple of examples, we have found that the consumption of antibiotics have decreased across many OECD countries, especially at the uh, early stages of the pandemic, but that have shifted and fluctuated over time. We also know that infection prevention and control uh, measures within hospitals and overall in healthcare settings have improved uh, in general. And again, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that have been rolled out in many OECD countries as well as EU EEA countries have actually curbed the spread of many infectious diseases, including resistant ones. In, contrary, in contrast to this, we've also noticed that 
there are factors that have been promoted that may ultimately increase the AMR burden in the countries that we look at. That includes uh, issues like implementation of policies that can promote the prudent use of antibiotics, a big issue that has been delayed uh, in multiple countries. We also note that vaccination campaigns for many of in the infectious diseases that are typically uh, scaled up and typically implemented with no problems have been hindered um, or temporarily halted. Again, uh, focusing more on the antimicrobial resistance area, today what I want to talk a little bit about is this, this work actually comes from a recent collaboration that we have had with the World Health Organization, focusing primarily on the G7 countries. But we do actually have our own reports uh, since 2018 that provide, again, research results that make an economic case for um, addressing the tech and tackling the burden of AMR across OECD countries and EUEA countries. So based on the work that we have done with the, uh, with the WHO, we do know that patients with resistance infections are more likely to develop complications, including sepsis. We also know from the literature that this leads to longer period, periods of hospitalizations. Also, these patients require, tend to require more expensive and aggressive treatments, which is a promoter of health expenditure. It surges up the expenditure. What we find in our research is that only in the G7 countries, so I'm only talking about seven countries here, the, um, uh, the burden of antimicrobial resistance, the cost of this exceeds about more, it, it costs more than $4 billion every year to treat these types of infections. What this means is essentially is that this is about 2.5 times the money that's spent on um, treating patients with HIV AIDS. And we also know from our own research that unless there is some effective action that can be put in place and scaled, the, the actions that are already placed being scaled up, the cost will continue to rise. And we also know that, again, from our research, uh, increased length of hospital stay is a major driver of healthcare expenditures. Uh, and this is not just for the G7 countries, but overall. And we know that every year, on average, about seven million days are spent in an addition uh, to, be, to, to be able to treat the infections that are caused by resistant organisms. And this is only, again, for seven countries. We calculate that this is approximately equivalent to using the entire acute bed capacity in countries like Slovak Republic or Lithuania. We're talking about a massive burden, even only in seven countries. Um, and we also know that greater occupancy rates in hospitals are going to negatively affect the impact of health workers' ability to respond to their patients' needs, the effectiveness of the IPC measures, and also they create conditions for exacerbating challenges around sepsis management. From the economic side, and I promise this is the last boring graph I'm going to show, is that we actually, mm -hmm. we are an economic foundation, so we tend to, our analysis tend to focus on making an economic case for investing in health. So in this case, it's very specific to AMR. The graph that I'm showing to you here sp uh, focuses uh, primarily on uh, investing, the return on investment on hand hygiene. So if we actually improved hand hygiene to s levels that are recommended by WHO and in other international organizations, and only in these seven countries again, so I'm talking about investing only a few dollars more for each person that lives in these countries. The return on investment is 11 to 1. What this means is that for each dollar that we invest, we get a return of $11 back. And on top of this, we actually see that there will be a prevention of about 30,000 deaths each year for simply improving hand hygiene in healthcare facilities. And we also see that depending on the uh, burden of each country, the return on investment is going to differ, with some countries reaping a lot more benefits compared to other countries that have lower over a burden. And to sum up, we know that investments that um, can help tackle AMR can also help manage uh, sepsis in a more efficient and effective way. Uh, and this is the last plug, and I'm actually going to wrap up after this, is that in our forthcoming uh, publication, we look at 11 interventions 
that are in line with the One Health approach, the multi-sectoral approach, that can help, help, uh, help curb the, the impact of AMR. So if we look at interventions that can, look at, uh, that can promote prudent use of antibiotics to promotion uh, of AMR and prevention of the spread of resistant infections, as well as to um, interventions that are beyond the health sector. So with this, I thank you all, and I get back to my seat. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll take general points and questions in the panel discussion, but does anyone have any specific questions for Ajay on the data that she's presented? Conor yeah. Rahat speaking. So I have some concerns when you say prudent use. I would, of antimicrobials, I would say appropriate use. As I discussed this morning, we lose more and more patients with delayed due to delayed, and you explicitly mentioned delayed uh, uh, prescription. The prescription. And I tell you, this is one of the major cause of deaths and long-term sequelae uh, on, on sepsis. That one comment. And the other comment is, I wonder, uh, when you have calculated the numbers uh, of and the money uh, uh, that is spent or unnecessarily um, spent uh, on AMR, whether you have considered that AMR is mostly a problem for the sickest of the sickest, who given to their impaired immune system function contract AMR. And it's not surprisingly that this at the same time, because they often are treated on the ICUs, of course, spend a lot of money. So that's just a, a comment you may consider and you may be asked by reviewers uh, when you submit your paper. <laughs> <laughs> Do, would you like to respond? Uh, I can very quickly respond to the questions. I do take the point about appropriate versus prudent use uh, language, and also the World Health Organization uses a language around optimization of the use of uh, antibiotics. So I do take the point about that. Uh, we do include delayed prescriptions as part of the analysis in here, because it is uh, actually in the AMR agenda, it's been promoted by multiple European countries as one way to, to, uh, to, to tackle AMR. So we typically select our interventions based on the country priorities and the priorities that are asked to us based on what countries are suggesting. So our research is, because it's very much country driven and country, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's country driven, this is one of the 11 interventions that, that we look at. But we of course do not ever suggest only one intervention over another as a panacea. Rather, we do look at the impact, both in terms of economic but health, and we do look at the return on investment on this. And uh, like you've mentioned, we do, for each of our interventions, we do try to um, provide a general description of the literature and the latest evidence on each one of them in terms of the potential positive and negative impacts. And in terms of the calculation of the costs, I really like it when people ask me methodology questions. Um, but to, uh, we actually do assume a, um, a societal perspective when we calculate our costs. This means that we don't necessarily only look at ICU care costs, but we actually look at uh, data provided to us by ECDC and national authorities in terms of the uh, burden, the AMR burden, the, the uh, incidence of infections. And our cost uh, calculations are, again, based on um, the data and statistics that are provided to us by, by generally by countries, and they don't only focus on ICU care. Um, I think that Thank you. could be it for now. So, um, and this is only an observation. It's not an opinion because I'm only a moderator. But um, the 11 sort of priorities for action map precisely to the priorities for action to improve outcomes from sepsis. And I think perhaps coming back to the previous discussions around breaking down these silos, we need to start talking about managing infection, not managing sepsis versus AMR, but not an opinion. 
So I think we're now going to hear from uh, Carolyn, if she's available online with some slides, please. Thanks, and hello to Brussels. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Ron, and the invitation to speak at this, this meeting. Um, I would like to give you a short uh, input on the burden of sepsis and COVID-19 in Germany. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, for Germany, uh, we know from large scale cohort studies that around 18% of ICU uh, treated patients are sepsis patients. And um, in these pa patients, sepsis is mostly um, of uh, hospital acquired um, origin uh, from lower respiratory tract infections and um, originates from gram negative bacteria. Uh, hospital mortality is around 40% and the curve on the right shows that in around uh, 20 days after sepsis onset, uh, nearly half of patients die. Um, that means the acute mortality is um, high even in a, a healthcare system in a high income country. Next slide, please. Um, coming to the hospital and um, population burden of sepsis, uh, we found that uh, using a nationwide database and identifying sepsis patients using ICD codes, um, around 150,000 um, patients are uh, treated in hospital with sepsis in Germany annually. Um, of note, around uh, this is around 1% um, of the acute uh, hospitalizations of Germany, um, but um, sepsis is related to around 14% um, of uh, death, uh, deaths in, in hospital. Um, so it's a very, very important um, disease to consider. And um, the nationwide incidence was around uh, 180 sepsis cases per 100,000 inhabitants in 2016. And interestingly, the, the incidence varied by uh, around ninefold between, between uh, the German districts. And some of this variation can be explained by a difference in, for example, socioeconomic status, um, or age structure, but uh, to be honest, um, for the, the most uh, most of this variance, we don't know where it comes from. Next slide, please. To some degree, uh, the variance may mirror um, differences in coding practices, for example, uh, between hospitals, because what we measure in hospital discharge data is the incidence of diagnosed and coded sepsis cases. And from validation studies comparing coding to um, gold standards of chart review, we know that sepsis is often uh, not coded correctly and um, identifying sepsis cases by coding has a very low sensitivity and positive predictive value uh, and can lead to uh, up to 2.2 fault underestimation of sepsis incidence. Next slide, please. Um, what we also don't know is um, how sepsis incidence developed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are some factors that might be associated with an uh, increase in sepsis incidence. For example, the, the, the increase of viral sepsis due to COVID-19, uh, delays in care for community acquired effect infection and um, other chronic diseases such as cancer. And on the other hand, a decrease of elective uh, admissions, surgeries, and other respiratory infections may have led to a uh, decrease in sepsis incidence. Next slide, please. For Germany, we know that during the um, COVID-19 pandemic, the incidence of um, sepsis coded as a primary hospital discharge diagnosis decreased by around 23% uh, um, between 2019-2020. Uh, and 2020. Next slide, please. Um, but um, in uh, 2020, the coding of sepsis in Germany also changed and there was no possibility to code sepsis as a complication of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, if we add uh, 
the potential COVID-19 related sepsis cases, uh, we come to a much higher estimate because um, previous meta-analysis has shown this, that the prevalence of sepsis is around um, 33% around hospital, among hospital-treated uh, COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. And in 2020, around 1.8 million COVID-19 cases occurred in uh, Germany, of which uh, 170,000 were treated uh, in hospital. Next slide, please. Which would add, add to another um, 55,000 COVID-related sepsis cases. But still, uh, we lack data to confirm these assumptions and uh, to better understand the impact of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, when talking about the burden of sepsis, I would like uh, to stress another point because the burden is not only the acute burden, um, but also the long-term burden of sepsis equally. Um, in a study including around 110,000 sepsis survivors based on health claims data, we found that around uh, three or four um, survivors suffer from new impairments in the 12 months after sepsis. Um, and around one third of survivors without pre existing nursing care dependency were, re were dependent on chronic care in the year after sepsis. Um, 12 month mortality was high, with another one third of patients dying in the year after the hospital discharge. And um, one fourth of previously working survivors um, did not resume work in the 12 month uh, post sepsis. Next, please. So um, we also found that, uh, the pay, that the impairments were also common in patients with uh, non severe sepsis, sepsis treated on normal wards, and in patients without pre-existing impairments, um, which led to high costs um, for index treatment and one-year follow-up in survivors, uh, which added up to around uh, 28 euro, also only considering direct costs. And um, in COVID-19 survivors, uh, this um, high proportion of patients suffering from long-term impairments is similar and also the fact that also patients not hospitalized with um, COVID-19 with mild uh, courses of disease suffer from impairments. Next slide, please. So taking all this together, uh, we can uh, say that there is a huge demand for aftercare, aftercare including uh, early screening for new impairments, early outpatient follow-up, and uh, referral to structured rehabilitation programs. Next slide, please. So to sum up, um, we know that there is a high burden of sepsis and sepsis sequelae in Germany with more than 150,000 patients um, and three out of four survivors affected every year. But we lack data for research and population level surveillance and uh, we need clinical data from prospective studies, electronic health records and registry, regist registries to overcome uh, the limitations of health claim data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Carolyn. I, I'm going to ask you one brief question to, to clarify for perhaps the non-clinicians in the audience, and, and then if there's any specific questions to your data, we'll take those. Uh, so could you just clarify what, what we mean by registries, please? What sort of data do we need to look at at a patient level to better understand the burden of sepsis? Um, well, um, registries um, exist in very different kinds, but I think it's it would be important to have um, a, a certain structure to re registration of uh, sepsis episodes, uh, including data on underlying pathogens, resistance, and structured um, long-term outcomes, for example, um, physical impairments, psychological impairments, cognitive impairments, um, so that we really understand um, the differences in, in underlying pathogens, in, in underlying acute uh, features, and uh, in uh, their impact on long-term outcomes. Um, 
um, because at the moment this is very difficult uh, data, diff data difficult to to get. Thank you so much. And I know Comrade has a comment or question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just on your data that you have shown on the regional distribution, this is huge differences in sepsis incidence over Germany. Wouldn't you mean that, given the fact that uh, we not only realized in general the under documentation in the IC, by ICD coding in the in the claims and administrative data, but that there is a variance between the incidence of sepsis in some hospitals who only document 11% of cases and, and others who document 70%. And this may perhaps also vary among regions because uh, so that's, I, it might just to be not too surprised on this large variation uh, within Germany. Thank yeah. you. Do we have any other questions specific to Carolyn's data? So not about the policy stuff, not about the big picture. <laughs> Perfect. So um, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to turn to um, Tiago and Christina in turn and, and ask one question each, if I may. So uh, Tiago, you're a GP. We are, we hope, emerging from a horrible <laughs> pandemic. Um, certainly in most countries, the attention of the media, they, you know, the BBC reported every day the number of people in intensive care beds and then reports in the media, videos of people in hospitals looking tired. But all we heard about in the community were the number of cases. What was it like for GPs? And I suppose, are there any lessons we need to learn as a society in terms of healthcare structure and opportunities? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ron. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm um, very honoured to be uh, present at a conference about uh, sepsis. You know, it's, it's a subject that is very far removed from, you know, from our reality in primary care. So I'm, I'm pleased with our representation. Well, you know, um, during the last few couple, uh, couple of th two, three years, you know, uh, you've, you, like you said, we were hearing in, in the media all the time, you know, the number of patients in ICU, in hospital, you know, admissions, uh, etc. But, you know, I felt that the, 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 the brunt of of the of COVID, you know, during the pandemic, has been in, in primary care because, as you know, you know, especially before the, vac the vaccination became a reality, you know, not, uh, nine out of ten patients, you know, were non-serious patients, you know, were patients with mild disease that could perfectly be managed in the community. And if hospital doctors were overwhelmed during the pandemic, particularly in the early stages, so too uh, were GPs. You know, of course, our practice suffered tremendous. Uh, changes. Of course, we we moved a lot of uh, a lot of our practice to uh, vir virtual, but we we remained open. You know, seeing um, face to face uh, COVID patients. Of course, m most of them it, you are are were patients with with mild uh, with mild illness. Uh, and in the beginning, we we organized ourselves in uh, we we often separated. Uh, the circuits, you know, respiratory patients and non-respiratory patients. So we, we, you have GP practices for COVID respiratory patients and GP practices for all other kinds of, of, of patients, you know, and patients who, and GPs who are um, working in these, uh, in the UK, you call them COVID-19 hubs, community hubs. You know, they, they have to wear P, is PPE uh, uh, and so on, you know. Um, and we, of course, in most of these patients, you know, at the time, especially in the beginning, you know, there was not much you could do. You know, you just provide reassurance that they're that they're okay, and and you 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 give you gave them guidance uh, on whether uh, if, if symptoms progressed and, and they got worse, you know, to, to, to come again or to go to hospital. So we only referred to hospital, you know, patients, you know, who got worse, you know, after after, after a week or so, you know, they, they start having shortness of breath, um, and of course. Uh, some of the patients that we end up referring to hospital, you know, we know and we've seen from the previous presentations that some of them end, uh, end up having sepsis during their hospital uh, admission. Now, what I felt, and now uh, um, going into the specific topic of this conference, um, I personally, I think, I mean, it's difficult to predict in, in general practice, you know, what ambulatory COVID-19 patients will be at high risk of developing sepsis. You know, there are some prediction models uh, that Put, uh, that actually were developed using primary care data, especially from the UK, uh, that can calculate the kind of a risk, uh, absolute risk of a patient uh, 
uh, developing severe COVID or severe COVID-19 outcomes, you know, like uh, death hospital and hospital admission. Now, what I'm not aware of is whether there's a specific risk prediction model for patients to develop uh, sepsis. Uh, and I know in the UK, these some of these uh, prediction models, for, I, I can think of immediately comes to, to the top of my head, Q-COVID, you know, it's embedded in the UK GP electronic uh, health record, you know, uh, but that's usually correlated with patients with the, that are older and have comor uh, comorbidities, so that those patients will be at higher risk of severe disease, you know, and then obviously, of course, of uh, of sepsis. Now, but I'm not aware if there's a specific um, prediction model uh, for, um, uh, for for sepsis in patients in, seen in uh, primary care. So uh, this is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiago. And, and I'm sure we'll come back to you with questions from the audience. So, um, Christina, we, we have a specific question for you. That uh, During the pandemic, um, there was obviously a lot of focus on people who'd survived particularly severe illness with COVID-19 and the long-term effects that they experience. Now, many of us in the room will know that long COVID, as it's become known, shares significant similarity with the after effects of sepsis and the impact on society was of no surprise. So what do you think we now need to do to address the needs of people with after effects of sepsis, whether we call it post-sepsis syndrome or long sepsis. And, and can we take advantage of what, of what happened with COVID? Yes, I, th <clears throat> I think we can take advantage. I think the awareness of the long-term consequences of an infection has increased enormously now in society. And I think that, Mike, it it might get it easier for those of us who wants to raise the awareness of long-term consequences of sepsis, no matter what the bacterial or in the infection comes from, or has in, uh, what flu, uh, a virus or bacteria that has been behind the infection. So I think that is an opportunity for us who would like to increase the awareness of the post-sepsis. Uh, and we wish that the awareness of long-term consequences um, is paid more attention so that the patient get more structured help now um, uh, to deal with those issues. And I hope that the COVID pandemic has maybe has opened some of the doors for those kind of conversations. Thank you so much, Christina. And again, just for something for people to think about and to the data, Carolyn was talking about the need for the understanding and the data that Ulrika was talking about, the need for this um, evidence of cost. It's about demonstrating to governments and policymakers that they can't afford mm -hmm. not to do this in terms of rehabilitating people into society, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, OK, well, well, we'll open the floor up now. We've got another 20 minutes or so uh, to take questions. You must have some burning questions. So the themes are around sort of recovery, around burden, around the linkage with COVID-19. Perhaps there might be questions around are people who've survived COVID-19 more at risk of developing sepsis in the future and what can we do about it? So please, we'll take questions from the floor. Do we have any? Simone. Start here. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank oh. you. Thank you. Yeah, I think we do need more uh, biomedical research uh, into the, the mechanisms that are driving those sequelae. Uh, like in long COVID, for instance, the neuroinflammation. Uh, so uh, people uh, can be uh, taken seriously by their GPs, for instance, when they complain about their brain fog and not being able to multitask anymore. So that's really an issue, neuroinflammation and all the things that are happening to the brain due to the impact of sepsis. Yeah, agreed. And maybe some of this work should be funded not just by industry stakeholders in the clinical space, but by large employers, because it's them who are hurt by this. I think Simone was first, comrade. 
Hi, I'm Simone from the European Sepsis Alliance. A question to Tiago, if he's still online with us. Um, he explicitly said that uh, yeah, sepsis is a bit remote from their, you know, uh, their job, but actually, 80 uh, percent, as we know, of the of the cases uh, you know, occur in the community. So actually, I think this is a recurring question in our discussions. So how can we involve actually? How can we make sure that uh, you know, in the community, patients, but also GPs, are able to recognize uh, yes. sepsis immediately and give immediately the right uh, treatment or indicate the right uh, procedures to the patients? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, I, I was actually thinking about that. You know, we, you know, primary care is a context of very low prevalence and incidence of sepsis. You know, I, I don't I don't remember. I, uh, I don't remember the last time I saw a patient with uh, possible sepsis in, in primary care. So it's very low prevalence and very low incidence. However, it's a high stakes a diagnosis, uh, like you say, you know, um, during our during our uh, GP training, especially when we rotate through certain um, uh, contacts like pediatrics, you know, we we are we, we learn, you know, the to identify red flags, especially you know in in children, um, and but you know it's a diagnosis that we can't miss, even though it, it, it's a bit like learning, you know. You know, our, our GP trainee, my GP trainees, you know, they often ask me, you know, oh, can we go on a course of advanced life support and advanced trauma life support and things like that? Well, of course you can and you should, but, you know, it, it, you, you may end up being de-skilled because you're not going to use those skills uh, very often. And it, it's also a bit of the reasoning here. Uh, uh, of course, so during our training, we, of course, we have to essentially absolutely learn the red flags to identify a possible patient with that comes to the GP practice with sepsis because it it can happen and it does happen um and we and, and, and you know and there and we it's a diagnosis that we cannot absolutely miss you know we, we uh, because because you know the because the prognosis could be dependent on that we uh, that we identify the the possible serious case early and and refer it immediately for further for further assessment so it's something that has to be very present during both our undergraduate and particularly our postgraduate training because identification of severe disease is something that we don't see every day in primary care but it's something that we cannot absolutely miss because the stakes are very high thank you can i just say sorry before before your question uh christina is a good example i think the first time you had sepsis uh it was really a gp at a, a, a normal health care center that recognized mm -hmm. what what you were ha what was happening so th it does happen you know, so it, it, it is, it's a good point, I think, Simona. Sorry, yeah, yeah, look. So, uh, uh, well, I would like to have your comment on, so we, we do have a definition for sepsis. Well, admittedly, it, it has its limitations, but we do have a definition for sepsis. And we're all concerned about the long-term consequences of sepsis. But are we not missing a definition of recovery from sepsis? How should we define what is recovery from sepsis? And then how should we do this? And also to work on the long-term consequences, the social impact, the economic impact, we need to have appropriate outcome measures. I'm not sure we do have them right now, so. I would like to have your comment on these two aspects, defining what is recovery, and about time points, about uh, uh, how to define it, <clears throat> and then um, developing specific outcome measures for evaluating the long-term impact of, of sepsis. Thank you, Jalali. So I think whilst Christine is formulating her response as to um, the first part of the question. Carolyn, could I, could I bring you in in terms of how we could define the outcomes that constitute recovery? Do you have an opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's complex, but there was a, um, a qualitative study on what a survivor's rate, um, rate of most, most importance for their recovery uh, some years ago. And um, one domain that emerged in this uh, study was the reintegration into normal living. Um, and 
I think that's a, a very important aspect when discussing um, the the recovery from sepsis because this is um, an endpoint that is um, subjective uh, for all survivors, but but really of importance. And for that purpose. Um, there are some some instruments that that can measure the reintegration into normal living um, and make it a, a potential outcome for studies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that that would be of importance yeah, to also include such aspects and, and further further studies. Thank you. And Christina, if I may, so you founded um, Sepsis Foreningen, um, the, the um, uh, Sepsis Society for Sweden, and represented the interests of patients to your government in the in the Swedish sepsis plan. So does that definition of recovery and integration back into society work for you as a sepsis survivor? And should it work for organizations like yours? Uh, what is, I don't know, what is going back to normal mm. life? Um, uh, not really what is normal life mm. uh, is that working or living at the same place as you lived before <laughs> or i think it's more i think it need more the answer um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah than normal life because there are so many different consequences that you can have so I think it's really need to point it down if it's possible to do studies then, I don't know, B but more nuanserad, yes. what is that called? Yeah. And I think I, that I, is... And we see that in the UK Sepsis Trust. We have nurses who support several thousand people a year who've had sepsis and it's very rare that someone returns to exactly the person they were before and they will either have a cognitive problem or a physical problem or a psychological problem and maybe we shouldn't say recovery is back to normal because that would no. be quite rare yeah yeah, yeah. comrade uh, i think we, we have not addressed um, yeah, does it work the, some of the questions that have came uh, up uh, in terms of doing research and um, and this is closely related to the opportunity that comes to us for due to these long COVID issues because there's a lot of funding at least in, uh, for uh, the long-term co consequences of COVID and and we must make sure that it's not this is one infection which may lead to long-term consequences and because policymakers tend to provide money to those which is most in but poorly understood on the relationship <laughs> between that this may be common for all infections, for, for many infections, uh, and, and definitely we have many more sepsis survivors than we have COVID survivors. And nobody so far has cared anything mm. on the long, t both the understanding and any programs, and that's what we are trying to lobbying. And, and there is interesting data just published uh, with big questionnaires to 5,000 COVID survivors in UK, for example, it just came out. And, and we should either do the same thing, just to prove again for policymakers, if we would ask 5,000 sepsis survivors and compare this, so because these kind of questionnaires, and this is also the question, what really comprises long-term consequences. So there, there are quite a number, and, and this has been acknowledged, it's what I learned this morning. Um, f several countries in, in Europe have acknowledged this kind of questionnaires. Mm -hmm. And this tells you that the lobby for understanding long-term consequences of COVID, which do, I don't know any consequence which not does happen in sepsis survivors. But it's hard to convince a policymaker that this is the case. So, and, and, and we need to work on this. And this is also about this, when I hear by Tiago uh, that what the uh, GPs 
uh, in UK have had in they did not use the word sepsis because also they did not understand that the severe cases of sepsis uh, of COVID are sepsis. sepsis. So that's why it, we needed to do this uh, survey with Chimarellos and, 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 and prove it. But still, it's not accepted. So we, we, we need to work on this kind of issues mm -hmm. because otherwise there are again silos within silos. So it's so ridiculous. Yeah, uh, uh, and and this goes even to a renumeration of for treatments and uh, uh, and and uh, and things like this uh, for sepsis survivor and and COVID survivors. They are about to make a law in Germany to get reimbursement for certain support uh, services for long term COVID. Yeah. So sepsis survivors should run crazy. Uh, if, if the, this is what I try to explain, but it's hard to 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 get over. Yeah? So that's it, it is hard, and and I, I think your point is well made. But I just wonder whether another driver for governments to listen to the data on long COVID is it was convenient to them because it helps them to justify their actions on society, which were inconvenient to people. They 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 wanted to prevent it. Uh, Antonio, please. My question is. Uh that I would like to know uh, the opinion from the from the panel uh, on can we prevent some uh, long-term uh, sequelas of these patients? Do you think that we can? Uh, because there are many groups that are working in this area to try to improve uh, the consequences on con the long-term consequences of cognitive uh, consequences, for example or for uh, the uh, the uh, the mobilization of the patients etc 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 and uh, and i would like to also to ask uh, 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 to the survivors <laughs> uh, what do you think we can do better in your case for example so We'll take the last question to Christina first, and then I'd like to bring Edge and Tiago in on the can we prevent? Because I don't think there's any data in the sepsis space, but Edge or Tiago might be aware of data in other conditions and other areas. I, I think it, was, it, it would be a great idea if there could be more structured studies on how to do the physical exercises bef after. Um, yeah, after the sepsis, because it, every time when I've met different physiotherapists, they, uh, I ask them if they had a, a sepsis patient for, before, and they say, no, but we can try. And that is not very convincing as a patient that they are trying for the first time with me. And then I ask, where are all the sepsis patients? Oh, I don't know. I haven't met them. And I've been on different neurological rehabs. So why, where are they? And I think, and when they are looking of, of how can I care a critical ill patient, there are very few studies. Uh, most of them are on how to prevent critical illness within the ICU. But if it's already had happened, what are you going, how can you treat them afterwards? I think that it would be a great idea for physical um, rehabilitation. Um, for the other ones, I don't know if it could be like the same that you working with some program that develop some sort of program on how to to treat patient after sepsis some knowledge based um, mm. yeah. so i think that would be great for us as patients also, in rehabilitations say something there uh, so maybe have uh, like post sepsis um, clinics, you know, where you sort mm -hmm. of, because it's it could be physical, but it could be also a cognitive or mm. psychological issues, yeah. and have somewhere where you can go afterwards and get yeah. a full understanding. Sorry, so, yeah. so. I, I think they have had that for post COVID. <laughs> yeah, at least in Sweden we have yeah. a few of them. Yeah. Why? idea that I have had. Why? Why can't we, we just bake them into post sepsis? Back the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
when there so are fewer fewer post covid patients but the post sepsis patient will continue so yeah. if you could build up those so that I, would I, be great. I don't think anyone would argue against the need for rehabilitation for people who've survived sepsis but what the medical activists face is the response from the policymakers well how do we pay for it and mm. and how to persuade them so how do we build a health economics argument that tells <laughs> uh, the former commissioner andrew kaitis and others that they can't afford not to rehabilitate people following sepsis okay uh, very easy question. Let me just right there uh, respond to it. But so speaking from the area that I specialize in, which is more on the resistance infections, one of the innovations that we have done in our recent work is that we've started to look into the long term consequences of resistance infections and we rely heavily on the literature that's on critical illnesses and return to work, for instance, um, after a long term illness and a long uh, an acute infection. So in our research, what we have actually shown is that when we don't look into the long-term effects of these infections, we actually underestimate the economic burden. Because I've only shown you today that the impact of these you know, AMR on health systems, but then there is a broader cost to the society. It's, uh, and just very barely, like one bong example is that return to work. We, these types of infections have massive consequences for labor markets that we depend on for our economic development, uh, in not just in high-income countries, but across the development spectrum. So one place that we can start from is actually to demonstrate, and we try to do that in our work in AMR, is that um, integrate the long-term costs of, of these in, uh, infections into the economic analysis. Uh, that's one area that I can quickly jump onto. Uh, but I agree with everybody else that's, that's uh, in the room is that for us, uh, you know, data crunchers to be able to do this in our analysis and in our models, we do need studies, we do need data that can show us uh, how people who are recovering from such infections are different in their lives, they're suffer suffering in ways that we can quantify and measure. That's an absolute priority across the board. Do, can I just, uh, Tiago, uh, can I ask you a very much simpler question? Um, you say that as a GP, you can't remember that uh, the last time you recognised someone as having sepsis acutely. As a GP, can you remember the last patient who came to you struggling following sepsis that you had to sort of help to move into rehabilitation? And if you can't remember, where are all these people? What, what's happening to them? Are they on their own? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. To be honest, um, uh, well, we're seeing a lot of long patients with long COVID, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, the patients who... Even patients who had just mild illness, which is the, is the majority of cases that we see in primary care, but they all but they all say one common thing. You know, I'm not the person that I used to be. You know, I'm different. You know, I, I get tired very very easily. I have ongoing shortness of breath. I have ongoing cough, and this and that. Um, what I wanted to stress further to what I said before. You know, clinically, it, a GP should keep their skills sharp, and you know, it's a test. It, it's really an ultimate test to our skills as a GP because you know, there's there's a there, there's the, the the threat that we may become complacent because we see just a very low proportion of severe disease in in, in primary care and may miss that one that one patient that comes into our door that has some some, some signs of uh, sepsis. Now, clinically. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to mention uh, one thing. You know, you've heard, you've all heard of the of Streptococcus A, Strep A. Uh, this winter, uh, particularly in the UK, where you, you may have heard in the news that several children died in the UK. Um, so, I mean, we're talking about low absolute numbers. You know, we're talking about maybe 10 children. It, it doesn't seem very much, but in terms of relative increases, it's a lot compared to previous uh, years. And although, and clinically, it may not always be straightforward to identify potentially serious patients. Sometimes we we need help, you know, to help from diagnostic tests. And the problem is that in primary care, not every European country has easy access to uh, point of care, uh, rapid tests to identify, for example, strep A in primary care. You know, the Nordic countries are very advanced in, in that regard, you know, uh, and even even some other countries, you know, the Czech Republic, you know, they, they have often multifunction devices to, to test for multiple uh, micro uh, organ, or, uh, organisms. And because in the current context, you know, where we have antibiotic shortages, you know, I don't, uh, you know, 
amoxicillin is in short supply, particularly in, yeah. in pediatric uh, formulations. And I've spoken with my the local pediatricians at my local hospital, and they all say, you know, oh, Tiago, you you have, you have to be very defensive. You know, uh, you know, every, every it's children that come in with fever and sore throat, you you, you should prescribe antibiotics. I mean. <laughs> It concerns me a bit, a bit uh, that approach, you know, particularly in the context, the wider context of uh, AMR. Um, and, and I don't think being defensive is also the solution. So I think the solution is that we in primary care, in order to complement, you know, the, our diagnostic acumen, we should we we, sh we should also have easy um, and uh, uh, low cost access to point of care text so that we. Uh, rapidly identify those patients who, that possibly have strep A and, and other and other pathogens so that we uh, um, are more likely to prescribe antibiotics appropriately and avoid the uh, patients uh, getting seriously ill. Yeah, a excellent point, Tiago. And, and we haven't discussed this much today, have we? But uh, certainly in the UK and from talking to colleagues in other countries, being able to better integrate point of care tests into clinical mm -hmm. systems is absolutely key both to diagnosing sepsis but also to antimicrobial stewardship it's so important and it's one of the recommendations in the UK's infection management coalition so we, we totally agree I think we've got time for one last question and I think Professor Reinhardt was itching to make a comment or ask a question yeah. did yeah. you have one? I, no? I, I would like to make a, a comment uh, on this issue uh, of rehabilitation, which options we have. We have rehabilitation for after stroke, after myocardial function, after cancer. Again, we need a comprehensive structured programs both uh, in hospital or post -hop hospital care and, and, and also in the community. So, so that, that's for sure. And there are quite a number of studies that even if you have a program which was suggested from a conference we held in Whistler five or six years ago, that if you post-discharge have the big five, which is to early recognize a recurrent infection, which to recognize to prevent uh, aspiration, which is um, to uh, treat chronic conditions, etc., results in a reduction of mortality, post-discharge, and re uh, re, uh, uh, re re readmissions. And there are uh, also, in terms of prevention, the best prevention is early recognition and also these immune modulatory treatments. So Dr. Cimarellos has published in Nature the effect of an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which not only resulted in a decrease in mortality, but also in the long-term sequelae measured by the WHO scale, which was developed in the COVID in this, uh, highly significantly. Again, that's why if nobody has understood why we should speak about sepsis, the difference between sepsis and an, and an n n infection is that there is this exploding and harming immune response and there are curves in terms of interference. And so, and this is the way, and this may be also the way because research, need for research was mentioned, this chronic inflammation goes on and it may be one, if we better understand these causes of the long-term consequence, which must not only stem from the acute hit, but from the ongoing persistent inflammation, which we know from pneumonia, etc. So these are then, we have the treatments uh, to, to counteract the bad effects of long-term and acute inflammation. So that's why we need to speak and use the word sepsis. So that is so crucial by everybody. So that's my take. Thank you. I mean, great uh, sort of summary and perspective. And, and if I might offer my own summary, I, I, I mean, I think what we've heard is that there is certainly a case for countries to offer routine rehabilitation to people who've survived sepsis. I, I think we've heard that sepsis is incredibly costly and by getting this right, probably just not in the space of AMR, but probably across the spectrum of infection, we can achieve a good return on investment. 
But I think in order to persuade our policymakers that they have to invest in this now, we need urgently population-level, patient-level data from contraction of infection through to recovery so that we can really understand this issue. So to our panellists in person and to our panellists online, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the session. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for a really interesting panel debate. Um, I think we can. this conversation will go on after this meeting, definitely. Um, so we have reached uh, shortly the end of this program. Uh, but before we leave here today, uh, I would like to invite Evangelos again up on stage to make some final remarks on today's program and maybe give us some hope for the future. So I would first of all like that, we, uh, ev that you share with us the call of action. Uh, before uh, the concluding remarks, allow me to tell you s some statistics. We had a total of 480 people who attended online, and uh, also we had a full uh, hall here, and uh, I believe that the whole event was a major success, and I would like to thank you all for your contribution. I would like to thank uh, our uh, sponsors who helped us for this event, uh, which are BD and Biomerieux. And uh, before ending with the most important thing, which is a call to action, I would like to acquaint you a bit with the foreseen activities of the European Sepsis uh, Alliance. Uh, the top one, you listened to that already, but I would like to repeat in exactly the same way as we presented uh, through the survey, the hurdles uh, that exist, the limitations of the daily clinical practice. It is very important and it's a huge argumentation for us to know what is the real cost of sepsis, both in short term and long term. And for this, you have listened already uh, to the efforts of uh, Ulrika and I would like to thank her wholeheartedly. And we are looking forward to your support towards this project. Uh, in, uh, during uh, the, uh, until the end of the year, we also plan probably during the autumn months, a series of webinars with focusing on the antimicrobial resistance and the proper handlings of antibiotics for the patient. And allow me to end up with the main key features which uh, were already uh, developed many years ago, but this is the real take home message. And this is for which we need to fight and struggle on a daily basis. Uh, the call to action mandates the reduction of bureaucratic hurdles and financial support to promote patient-oriented clinical research on sepsis by the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, similar to what is done by a Medical Advanced Research and Development Authority in the U.S. via the Horizon Europe program. It is mandatory that sepsis is a priority for the European CDC. What is needed also is funding public awareness campaigns on sepsis, similarly to other existing disease. Here it is stated sexually transmitted disease, and you remember very well about the HIV pandemic, and the HIV pandemic was withheld due to the international awareness and efforts put together. There is a mandatory need for the inclusion of infection control and early sepsis detection no notions in the first eight courses and school curricula in all European member states. And we had a lot of discussion about that. There is need of legislative measures to introduce and implement evidence-based quality improvements in hospitals and also in the emergency departments in combination with hospital-wide training of medical staff on the early detection and treatment of sepsis and acute life-threatening illnesses. It is mandatory that all hospitals have an availability continuously on 24-7 basis of early detection, microbial diagnostics for sepsis and antimicrobial resistance. We require regulations for the integration and optimization of early sepsis detection in outpatient, pre-hospital emergency medical care and emergency department. There is need for comprehensive treatment programs and research for long-term effects of sepsis, including COVID-19 and other infectious diseases at the European and national level. 
Ad finally, addressing the burden of sepsis and the synergies with the fight against antimicrobial resistance in the upcoming European Council recommendations and the agendas of the Covenant Parliamentary Committees. Thank you very much for being here, and we are fully committed to this fight against this ominous disease. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here today and for all of you who are, have been joining us online. Uh,